like Pulitzer Prize. Okay. But I'm more like the free parting gift if you hurry up and order now. <laughs> All right. We have Javon Pulitzer, which I know I messed up, Pulitzer. but what is, what's got Pulitzer. Pulitzer. All right. We got it. And you have done amazing things, award-winning inventor, uh, first-generation German, Jewish, American, found a companies, <laughs> millions and millions, of, you know, what, in total of patents, over $250 million. Uh, that's something to be uh, quite proud of and at an extremely young age. And even after some ups and downs, still striving. And I think you're a great example when you kind of got screwed early on. You didn't give up. You kept going and going and going. And that's a great example, especially now when you look at the world. You better believe it. Yeah, a rule of thumb is never give up. You're, you, you are the only one that can tell you to quit. Nobody else can. That's great. Right? I learned so much from, from my first big billion-dollar company going down. I learned far more than that than anything else in my life. Yeah, sometimes you need to fail to succeed, right? You better believe it. Or if they say, if at first you don't succeed, Suck a lot harder. Goes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> ah, you're the man. <laughs> so this brings me to a great, a great question that I want to ask you, unrelated to uh, all of your accomplishments. What am I missing with this Balenciaga thing? So we have Kim doing whatever. What am I missing? Because to me, for a company like that to not have double, triple check that with the amount of money that's going through, what am I missing? Well, typically, um, from an agency standpoint, understand how the, the companies operate. This was probably handled by a large agency at that point. And so if it's being handled by a large agency, the chances of CEOs uh, up to the vice president level of any of any of that level actually signing off on it are very null. And so it would have probably just been a product catalog person. I'll just use that as a generic term. And we're either dealing with they completely missed it, which they should be terminated, or in fact, they support it. It's that simple. And, you know, I think we've kind of learned out there not to challenge art. And these agencies push this stuff on us. And you learn when you get to a certain size and you're spending money with the agencies, I think many people just don't bother to ask questions because they think the agencies are experts. Personally, whatever agency hired, the photographer, the team, the product placement, the manufacturing of anything they did, catalogs or otherwise, every one of them should be fired. Wow. So that makes sense. So they, they could have hired a marketing team, like you said, just like when you were I or like if I go to get a guest, a lot of times there's 70 different layers before the actual person. You know what I mean? So you're saying with this, least. you know, maybe they hired a, a middleman marketing, marketing agency. They wanted to get a message out. It wasn't overlooked by the heads of, uh, you know, Beyonce Aga. They thought that it was okay and they put it out and now they're getting destroyed. I just, well, I it probably go, the cycle is they have agencies to begin with, whether it's radio ads, print ads or whatever. So it probably wasn't, they hired just a special agency. It's probably just an over- you know, arcing uh, agency, the the old things of the world, like the WPPs and all these other, you know, multi-billion dollar agencies. And they're just expected to know what to do. But all of those agencies, unfortunately, have gone to a very woke side. And so this is either a woke or a joke, meaning it's either something very illicit that they put in there, or sometimes you can find your teams that you hire, try to work in little cookies and tricks into it. I'll give you an example. I was about to, and this was in 2020, CNN, top of its game. I'm going to go in and talk about my some of my television technology that I was doing with NBC and everybody else already. And I'm getting ready to do a demo. And I luckily, I pulled it up before I'm in pitching at CNN. And my geeks at the time decided in the mock-up for CNN to put CNN Network instead of CNN Network. And it was their own little FU inside, right? Joke, thinking nobody would see it. Luckily, I saw it before the meeting, and I freaking came unglued because I'm going in to pitch CNN and what uh, is a $100 million deal, and I'm going to walk in with fucking CNN Network? You got to be kidding me. So sometimes 
ad teams and geeks do stuff like that, screwing around. But it would be interesting to get at the bottom of it, because as many of the images as I saw with the, the little children in bondage and their teddy bear stuff and the symbolism in it, that was far more than just one little memo slipped in. There was a tremendous amount of pedo messaging in there. That tells me it was very intentional by design. I agree with you. Man. I, I did the same because, you know, they they did that shot a hundred times. So initially I thought, well, maybe they picked the wrong shot and didn't realize the meaning. But then I kept seeing them. And I'm, you know, just like you said, th this is more than just uh, somebody picked the wrong shot by accident. You know, well, I saw the teddy bear and you saw the little studded thing. Yeah. And since I have the same outfit, I. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're great man you're fun you, next time i'm flying your ass in here i don't want to hear about scheduling problems i'm, I'm, I'm sorry my schedule was so whacked and it's so whack doing this stuff you can imagine with all the stuff with the elections oh, and the and stuff, my schedule's whack but yeah don't get me going on my humor but uh yeah i just like to keep people on their toes it's great <laughs> now, no i don't have i would never have a studded outfit like that not a, now a pony outfit or a puppy outfit that's something different but a studded outfit no way <laughs> that, 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 that's a little bit, bit too much a horse would be cool though because <laughs> because when they're born they can run which is kind of interesting there you go and then um what anyway, about no i just mess with people's minds it's just fun you know it keeps it fun and then what do you think about this apple shit about them talking about taking Twitter off the App Store which you know then Google would follow and everything else do you think that that's actually something they would do uh, Elon just posted two minutes ago a video, and uh, he's at the Apple headquarters, and he took a video of the big circular pond because of the circular building and stuff, but it was him and Tim Cook. And the way you know it is because you can recognize Elon's shadow filming it, but you can clearly see in the same shadow Tim Cook and his glasses and stuff, so you know it's him. I'm sure they had a very serious heart-to-heart. -heart uh, I don't think Apple would do that at all. It would cause such an exodus. It would create a potential uh, monopoly investigation because in reality, there's only two companies you deal with, Android, Apple. And since you're on that platform, you're subject to their rules. And yes, between those two and with those two being in lockstep, they can stop business or destroy a business. I think it would be dangerous uh, for Apple to even really consider it, but don't put it past these companies to float it to see what kind of pushback they get. Because if they could get away with it, they would, but I don't think they will. Yeah, because it would be too risky. Because if they do that, that would just crash. That would just destroy everything because then then it's right in front of your face that no matter what you do, they're going to control everything, no matter what. It would it would send off alarm bells that would wake up everything from Republicans to the Democratic Party to the Weed Party to the Rock Party, you name it, that realizes, man, we do have some overlords. If you look at studies, studies show that most people – would be willing to be without their spouse on a deserted island, but not their phone. And so you have to realize how much we've been we've become tethered to these devices. I think when you start messing with it at the device level, and that is certainly at the device level, it would create a complication. I, I look at this landscape, my uh, software suite, my patents, my, one of my core patent suites, happens to be I bridge these gaps. I'm on every iPhone device. I'm on every Android device and every mobile device out there. And that's the holy grail of anything. And I think if they mess with that, the government would face such pushback that they would have to break it apart. And let's say Apple did this right now. Another uh, report that you're going to see breaking here shortly is Huawei. You've heard that name mm. before. That's that's the third largest manufacturer of mobile phones out there. All of the mobile phone manufacturers license my technology. There's only one that uses it that doesn't license it, and that's Huawei. And you can't get to Huawei because it's 
Chinese government, right? But yet there's Huawei but, parts in the towers. That's what's crazy. That's right. <laughs> you better believe it. So Huawei, right now, people are realizing where they're out uh, filming protests in China, Huawei on their phones and their users, and, and, and by the way, China Mobile is owned by the Chinese government. They are able to see and understand that you filmed that, and they're auto scrubbing it on your phone automatically. Automatically, so the, this they're, is some dangerous territory. So they're just uh, basically they're automatically dumping it, right? It's an no, automatic dump. Uh, I've already seen video coming out of China, and you'll see everybody's videos, and it'll just be blank there and won't play. They understand what you're recording, and by the way, that's a dangerous thing. Because unbeknownst to most people in this industry, they're trying to bring that same Trojan horse technology to the United States that forget Twitter, forget Facebook, forget all social media everywhere. If the government doesn't want you to see it or say it, they do it at that level. You'll never know. Uh, I had uh, Dr. Robert Epstein in, the most accomplished uh, research psychologist in the world. And he scared the shit out of me. Do you know who that is? Yeah, you, you know. I've, I've, heard, I've heard the name. Yeah. he And uh, after talking to him for four hours, whoa, you realize a lot. Google shows you what they want to show you. Like, for instance, and I wanted right. to talk to you about this, too, because of some of the election things you're doing. It even got me. At first, they say, okay, you know, uh, box three was in Arizona. Nobody could get into it, whatever. The lady goes in front of the Senate. She talks, but it's on YouTube. And I had to catch myself after talking to Epstein because at first I was like, oh, we, you know, and they got him box three, but it's a diversion. So now you have, because why would Google, who owns YouTube, who's controlling all of this stuff, I think you would agree to an extent. Yeah. Why would they allow that out on YouTube? Because they want you to see it. So in my opinion, then when 24 comes, where are we at? We're looking for box three, seven, four, mail-ins. And meanwhile, they're coming in the back corner while everybody's looking here with their new method of, let's just call call a duck a duck, fraud. You this episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss. You name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So if you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS media. The link is in the description at the top. This episode is sponsored by WestonJohnBoucher.com. Even after a decade of exposure to the fashion industry while fully immersed in the modeling world, model and future designer Weston John Boucher still hadn't found clothing that checked every box when it came to look, feel, quality, durability, and price. His solution was to create a menswear brand that would bridge the gap between designer-level pieces and reasonable price points without sacrificing quality. Weston's aim was to provide men who prioritize their health with effortless sophistication and style through simplicity of flattering fits, handsome designs, and amazingly comfortable materials. It's time to elevate your style. Experience obtainable luxury by Weston John Boucher at WestonJohnBoucher.com. Use the code Tommy to save 25% off your first purchase, their largest discount ever. I'll tell you right now, it would give Imperial Armani, Giorgio Armani, Page a run for its money. So go to Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N-J-O-N-B-O-U-C-H-E-R.com. Use the code Tommy, T-O-M-M-Y, and save 25% off. The link is in the description below. You have, you have it. Um, they are. 
that's why I talk in my radio program about join my program, listen, and I'll give you a mental enema because that's what it takes. we got to get all this crap out of their head and they screw with their head. And this is a psychological operation. They will let certain things through to validate it in your mind. And what they're trying to build right now is that is a valid standard. Let's just, let's just dis- dissect that one since you brought it up. So here's Maricopa. People, and you have to understand the scale of this. People knew in 2020 from an audit in 2020 that this whole thing was screwy. There were so many ways they did stuff with their ballots. It was screwy. So people learned, okay, mail-in ballots have a higher chance of being used fraudulently. So what people did in Maricopa preparing for 2022 midterms is they held on to their mail-in ballot. And they went into the physical location to vote. Now, a a midterm is very lucky historically to have 20% of the votes of a general election. Okay. So in Maricopa 2020 presidential election, 2.1 million ballots in Maricopa. If we look at election day, that was about 165,644 ballots election day. Now let's go to this midterm. Should be about 20% of that. 248,000 walk-in votes. Now, when you when they knew this was coming, people were backlash saying, Maricopa, we just do not trust you and we don't trust our voting systems. The people prepared to not use their mail-in ballots and to walk in. So these guys, I call them the rat bastards, had to figure out what can they do. So in a very simple maneuver, which is only a machine hack, They just made the night before every one of those machines worked. However, in Maricopa, in 71 precincts or 748 precincts, they're pushed down to 200 vote centers. 71 of the 200 vote centers instantly the morning of election had problems. And the problems were the machines would not take the ballots in. And so magically, Well, hey, that's what that little number three is for on here. Now, they never had them numbered like that before. (laughs) That was never in protocol. It was never handled that way. If a ballot wouldn't scan, they would have a tech on it, fix it, or replace the machine. There was never that slot to do that or that divider. So I ask you, how did they know to do it? So what they did, when you think about it, because everybody's in a hurry, I tell people, you better on voting day be, be prepared to stand in line 10 hours. This is saving your country. It's not, you're not going to rush around to do it, but people have to leave. And so what they did by a little simple machinery quirk, which can be done from a central location, they made them not work and said, oh, okay, just drop them in this slot. So what did they do? They circumvented the will of the people. When you intentionally didn't send in your mail-in ballot, And remember, Maricopa has been voting by mail for more than a decade. 76% of its voters are automatic mail ballots. When people revolted against that and said, I'm not going to do this mail-in ballot and walk in, they expect it to be fill it out, check it, look at it, make sure it is, run into that machine, because that machine confirms them their vote went in right there, but they circumvented it. And when they made people stick it in that little slot without scanning it in, they reverted you right back to a mail-in ballot, which was, okay, we have it. Trust us. We'll scan them in. And wasn't there... Simple hack, simple hack but that's what they did. And wasn't there uh, two or 300 ballots already in there when, when they had finally opened it? They had found two or 300, and that was just enough to push it over that shouldn't have been in there. It depends on where you it depends on where you look at it. I'm I'm not aware with that particular report, but I'll tell you a few of the problems that are had with this. I'll, I'll give you a 2021 first. Thank I you. mean a 2020 first. They opened some of these vote centers in a staggered basis. Remember in Maricopa, Arizona, they don't have election day. They have election month. Right? What is it with that? You get to send in your mail-in ballots over three weeks. And then you get to vote on election day, and you still have five or six days after that to cure it if something's wrong with it. They have voting month. What the fuck is that? Some of these precincts were stagger opening. And so imagine being the first person in line on the first day the the precinct vote the vote centers open. 
knowing you're casting the very first ballot, you walk in, they print your ballot, you fill it out, you fold it in half or in thirds, and you're going to drop it in the box, but you can't fit it in the box because the ballot box is already stuffed. Those are true, true affidavits and observations, and we caught them in 2020. So here, there's so many ways to that these things are broken. People don't realize it. But in Arizona, yes, there are, they say it only affected maybe 17,000 ballots. But if you look at the process, they here was the process. For everything that came in, Door number three, let's make a deal, right? So you have a, a, a bin, like a trash can that the scanner sets on. What they did is they just put a divider in it. So the backside was when it fed into the machine, boop, there goes the ballot. It poops into the can. There's a divider. And then in the front where you pay, place it in block, box number three, they'll call that, oh, we didn't scan it. Well, a few things happen. Number one, in several of these places, they accidentally took out the, the divider. Oops, are bad. Well, you can't rerun them all because that would be double voting, and they have no way to tell. And so those just kind of disappeared into the vapor. The second part of it is, okay, in these little slots where you went into number three and they managed to keep them divided, not have idiots do it, here was their procedure. We're going to put them in a black bag. We're going to zip the black bag. And we're going to put a sticker over the zipper. We're going to put a sticker over the zipper so we know it's safe and nobody's rifled it. Now, the key operative word here is there's 17,000 of these, they say. These black bags will hold approximately 10,000 ballots in them. On the 14th at 1.34 in the afternoon, they brought the black bags in. But they brought 30 of them in. Isn't that convenient? You do the math. <clears throat> Wasn't 17,000. That's, that's why and I the always... The way we were able to see this is on the security video. It's all a, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a royal mess. It's a mess, and it's, it, it's hard for me to believe that they're not all working together in some way, shape, or form. You can rig these elections without everybody working together. Yeah, it's that. I know that sounds really nuts. Not anymore. But let me give you an example. I'm telling you right now, you could have zero people on the ground that are not criminals, and, and most of these people aren't. That's why they fight it so hard. These people are going, are you fucking kidding me? You're insulting me, you white capitalist pig. I've been doing this for 30 years. Don't tell me what we do. It can be done right under their noses. And they never know it. But these machines, back in Maricopa in 2020, there were 30,000 anonymous incursions into the voting files as the vote's going on. And that's Not just supposed to there. Be one. That's just there. Yes, 30,000. And when you go in, that doesn't mean they're changing one ballot. You could change 1,000 at a time. There were 30. Thousand anonymous incursions. By the way, how do you anonymous, anonymously incur into the election database as it's going when none of these machines are connected online? It's all word sausage they do. Yep. It's all word sausage. Unbelievable. And that's the con game. It's yeah. everything's broken from top to bottom. And la last thing on that, and then we'll get to all your stuff. So how do you fix that? Like, you know. 2024 the same thing will happen again and and then people start to no. give up on voting wrong you're doing it right now what you are doing right now is fixing this and let me tell you why and there's a big difference right now in 2022 than there was in 2020 here is how the racket works first let me tell you how the racket works then you'll understand what they did and then you'll understand where we are because our eyes are open we know more now as American citizens about voting, how it's counted, how it should be done than ever. There is no turning back our eyes open. They cannot put this genie back in the bottle. So let's go back in time. If you look at any of the government sites or election sites, they will tell you voter fraud is extremely rare. It, it almost doesn't even happen. Now, here's how they do it. Again, it's word sausage, so pay attention. 
You take something like Maricopa County, uh, Maricopa County Arizona, 2.5 million registered voters. In 2020, they found a woman who had voted her dead mother's ballot. So they can catch it immediately. They went to that one woman who admitted, you're right, I voted my dead mother's ballot, but I was only voting it because that's what she wanted, and she died before the election. They indict her. They do a plea deal. She pleads down, pays a stupid little fine, and hey, look, we caught voter fraud. Now let's do the math. 2.5 million ballots, one person caught. And so they do this on person on purpose to find that one act so they can point to it. Look, it's so rare. I mean, one out of 2.5 million, and that's one county. Get it? Mm -hmm. That's how the racket goes. Now, let me play this back to you. If you and I were in a state, and uh, I understand you're in Florida, so let's say it was DeSantis, right? And DeSantis was your man. And DeSantis lost by 100,000 votes. Now, we'll relate this to what happened in 2020. You heard William Barr, after everybody saw all kinds of irregularities, say, we have looked into it, and we have decided that there's, we're not going to hire a special prosecutor because there's just not enough evidence of voter fraud to make a material difference in the outcome of the election. Now, let me decode that for you, what he told you. If it was 100,000 and it's your guy and you and I are partnering together and we find 90,000 bad votes, illegals, Hondurans, Venezuelans, and then there's one large group of people called the trans living. Are you familiar with the trans living? Those are people that are dead that only identify as living. Oh, okay. We're not supposed to identify. We're not supposed to discriminate. You know, That's a new one, trans huh? Living. Trans living. living. All kinds of dead people that vote, right? Love to know how they came up with that name, trans living. Jesus. <laughs> so you got all these votes in there. <laughs> and you and I find 90,000. And we go to the attorney general and we say, look, look at all these bad voters we found. Now, you and I, using common sense and logic, would go, that AG should get upset and go, oh, my God, look how much you found. We've got to look into this. Well, you know what the AG says? The AG says, well, you don't have enough to make a material difference to the outcome of the election. Now, what does that mean? Because the election was so-called called and won by 100,000 votes, if you and I don't walk in the door with 110,000 bad votes, because they're going to try to take off as many as they can, they have no obligation to look at it. Mother so you can find all the fraud in the world. Mm -hmm. But if they believe it won't make a material difference to the outcome of the election, they're not going to look at it. But also, there is also a reason why they always say voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. We have two types. There is voter fraud, where somebody will invariably vote their dead mother's ballot or go steal a ballot, vote or whatever. That's voter fraud. What's really at issue here is called election fraud. Now, that's different. That means the executives, the people, the mailer, the, the politicals, the legislators, all that. That is federal racketeering, RICO. Mob. Huge teeth. Basically that's the mob. why they avoid it. Yeah. But you better believe it. The two-finger Tony and Vinny ain't going <laughs> to yeah. let it happen. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, not on my watch. Right? So they're not going to be let it be looked into. So they stay away. They well, stay away. Where's Tony? Where's um, where, where's really little need to look at? Which is look, Javon. Where, where where's little uh, where's little Tony Falfucci? Where, where's where's little Tony? At? Right. Where's he at? You know his daughter's running uh Twitter uh you know uh, underwriting. Well, where are they at? Where's Nicole? Where are they at? Well, we stuck him in the little black zipper bag, boss. Like you said, and we put the little sticker on it and dropped it in the river. Yeah, we had to get rid of him. What were we gonna do? They 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 went too far. Forget about it. Forget about it. That's right. Forget about it, it, JP. I'm telling you. That's how I do it, JP. It's that way I won't mess up your name. <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. I've been called worse. Crazy, <laughs> huh? And then and they just get away with it. This is a match. Yeah. But it's great that, you know, me, you, you know, the, the last five, Dr. Malone, McCullough, you know, Epstein, all those guys, you know, them coming out really gets all this out, you know? 
Well, when you talk to a crowd that might skew younger for some of these things, your Spotify and everything else like that, we're reaching people. This, look, this affects everybody. This is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. I agree. This is a freedom issue. This is a freedom issue, period. And I'll give you an example. I didn't get into this because I was a Trump lover, although I happen to respect President Trump. Even if the Republicans did it, and they have done it, believe me, because we have a uniparty. We don't have two parties. I would still be doing my job because it's not about who won the presidency. It's about whether we continue to live in the greatest nation in the planet. 160 countries, 160 countries break into our borders every single freaking day because they want what we got. And that also means the big bad cabals in the other countries want to bring us in line and want to control us. So we have the gift of being American citizens, and we've got to fix this. So I'll give you an example. If, in fact, uh, somebody decided in X state or X party that we're going to lower the sexual consent age to five, which nobody would agree to, hopefully. hopefully. But you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're in power. Then all of a sudden they've circumvented you. This affects every one of us. Just like laws can shut down conservatives, there can be laws that say if you're gay or you're bi or whatever you, if you identify as a furry, furry teddy bear one day, that that is not allowed and you're gone. And it's coming, folks. When you've got a government that puts in 87,000 brand new IRS agents and they've now limited the uh, check of check on transactions by six to six hundred dollars from seven thousand dollars they're watching everything they limited what i I didn't see that they limited what well here's let's go back in time if if you and i in 80 would have walked into a bank with cash and we were going to deposit a hundred thousand dollars in cash immediately that bank triggers a direct hotline to the irs now the way people would get around it is you can have your same hundred grand but it's in 10 suitcases and it's ten thousand dollars each and you go to 10 different places and you deposit it none of it triggers the irs that's how it used to be then 88 maybe they reduced it to like seven thousand dollars they so meaning you walk in with cash, you're a bartender, you have a hell of a night, you're a stripper, make that an hour, it doesn't matter. And when you deposit that cash, as long as it's not seven more than $7,000, it doesn't go automatically knocking on the IRS's door saying, hey, this is cash and look at this. That was the last time I dealt with it was when they cut it down to the seven grand. So if I wanted to deposit, I would deposit sixty five hundred. It was like nine 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 nine, and then you would do six nine nine nine. And I guess now it's even. I guess it's in the hundreds now. Now it's six. Now it's six hundred bucks. Wow! Can you believe that? It's six hundred bucks. Oh, by the way, hey, now PayPal and all of those are now forced to report it any transaction over six hundred bucks. So you wonder what the IRS IRS agents agents are for? There you go. There you go. Every one of them, 87,000 of these people are armed. Remember everybody, well, you may or may not know, part of the chatter underneath for over the last six years is why has the government been buying up millions and millions of rounds of ammunition? Not for the Army. IRS. That's what this was for. You know what I thought it was for? Javon, you know what I thought it was for? I thought they were going to go after everybody that had crypto. And I thought they were going to grandfather all that money in from the crypto, the big, you know, the Bitcoin, the NFT money, all that copyright shit that's going to come down and hit them on the head sooner or later. I don't see how you can make an NFT of Michael Jordan and make millions of dollars. And at some point, you're not going to get buried by his people, but whatever. So I thought that they had gotten them. This was before Epstein, Malone, McCalla, all the and you, all you guys with these big brains and my peanut brain over here. I thought it was because of the crypto, but that makes no, total you, sense. Got, 
No, I'm I'm about to finish it. Here you go. What I was just about to say Where's when you brought punch, give me give me the punchline. No, here's the punchline. <laughs> and now they wrote the executive order for the digital dollar. Motherfuckers. Biden signed an executive order for the digital dollar. Three leading crypto leaders, one for the coin coding with the uh, blockchain, mm -hmm. one for the exchange tracking and monetization platforms, one for the transfer platforms, three of them, have all mysteriously died in the last 45 days. Hmm. Isn't that a uh, shocker and being that his name was the all over? The government is now going to try to enforce their own coin. We go to that. They don't like you. They don't like what you say. They'll just shut off your coin. You can't, you can't sue them for it because the money's still there. They're not taking it. They just won't give you access to it. They'll starve your ass down. That's where we're headed next, brother. Oh, I'm with you. I, I believe I believe it. I've stayed away from it from day one. I refuse to. I respect anybody who's into it. But if I don't know who's running it, and to me, I a lot of people will come in and they're with this association with the crypto thing. And I say, have you ever had millions of dollars? And they'll say, I'm getting there. Okay. Well, let me explain something to you. Because at one time in my life, I had millions of dollars. When there's that kind of money around, and with Bitcoin, we're not talking millions. We're talking way, way, way right. a lot. There is a puppet right. master. And if, and in my, in my opinion, if you are to think that that kind of money is floating around and there is not a puppet master or ma masters, I think you're insane and completely naive. I mean, you've, you de believe it. you've dealt with, I mean, I got, it'll take me a year to read off all the major companies you've worked with. But from you, the companies you've worked with, there's no way that amount of money just floats around and nobody has the strings to it. Would you agree? Mm -mm. All of it has strings. To it. I 100% agree with it. They know every movement at every time. They know so much about us, it's nuts. And if we move to a true digital currency economy, they only have two things left. Number one, they've taken over the media. Traditional media, not what you and I do, podcast, video, or that. We're the new media who can call it like it is because we're not owing to puppet masters. But the media is over. It's gone. Now, what's happened in the media is in 2012, in the Obama administration, they overturned or they rewrote the smith munt Act, which made it legal for the government to propagandize you and for the government to pay the networks. That's why all of these rat bastards came out where they used to say, we're fair and balanced, and they all came out extreme left. Total crap. So they've taken control of the media. Secondly, they already own academia because they give uh, the institutions, universities and stuff, all this ungodly money and tuition have no regulation over it, do all the loans for it. They just rake in tons of money, allow them to take donations. And that's why Hillary's daughter, let's say, can go do a speech and, and claim a million or a $2 million fee. It's how they launder money back. Wow. So now they've got a academia. Now we know they have politicians more than we ever thought. And I'll make an admission here. Number one, I never talked about the fact that I was a conservative, but I always have been. Now, I'm a different type of conservative. I've lived in, you know, L.A. and all over and stuff. And so I'm a lot more liberal. Like, you know, I, I loved L.A. because you just screw your lights out with beautiful people all the time. Right. So uh, that's not <laughs> a churchy conservative. Right. So I'm not as my kind of guy up as a lot of people. And I've done a lot of shit. I wouldn't want my grandmother, God rest her soul, to know. You know what I mean? You and me both. But. I don't want I that gravy spoon. I don't want to get hit with the gravy spoon anymore. I've had enough well, of it. I always tell people I can never run for office. I tell them I could never run for office for two reasons. It's my past. I said, number one, I have to admit it, that I, and this is a true confession, I physically abused my mother. I, I, I punched her and I kicked her. And it was very horrible. And she talked about it forever. Now, granted, I was six months and still in the womb, but I punched <laughs> the shot, right? You got me on that one. I was waiting. I was waiting. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. He's like telling. No, but no, it's true. It's true. You know, they're going to go back that far. Yeah. And so I have to admit, I can't be in public life. The second thing I have to admit is I did live in Hollywood. I lived out in Calabasas. 
And from from the time of Calabasas to where I moved right up from the Whiskey a Go-Go, Sylvester Stallone's to my top left from my back porch, Madonna's right below me, right up the hill from Whiskey a Go-Go, right? And I tell people, I said, you know, I lived a wild Los Angeles lifestyle. I said, as a matter of fact, I knew a lot of TV stars. I knew Richard Gere. Uh, and you heard that story about Richard Gere was my fucking gerbil. So can you, ima- can you imagine the you pussy know? he knocked down? Can you imagine? <laughs> can you I imagine? That story, so you don't know that when you're too young. No, I don't so know that one, but I know how many girls yeah. he probably took down. Every girl on the planet yeah, when yeah, that came well, out. Just, yeah, that's just a joke out there, folks, for yeah. that one. But I always talk, they'll find anything for you. They can pass on you, but I can't run for office. So they're going to, they own media. They own academia. They own our politicians. You know, you're talking about knocking the lining out of it. That's the fastest way to take an atter- a, a politician out. I can go to and be and have an announcement at a speaking engagement that I'm going to be there, which I try to limit. But I'm telling you, from the moment I hit a ground in a hotel, it's not that I have groupies. They are sending in people to set you up. Because they're going to try to triangulate you. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine being a politician, and I've had several discussions with brand new politicians that are either about to be seated or running. And I said, here's the number one. You're going to have to sit down your wife, and you're going to have to have a discussion because (laughs) they are going to throw the most amazing pussy in the world at you nonstop. (laughs) You ain't lying. And they do it just to compromise you because they're going to own you. And you have got to be aware of that. Mm-hmm. And you got to make sure you're in a strong marriage. You got to stay away from it. But if you don't, you're going to have to be able to weather the storm because that's how they compromise people. So they've got a lot of our, our politicians in their back pockets, or they'll send money in a very circuitous way, kind of around. And you think it's coming from what's a clean source. You're happy to get you know a million dollar for your pack, but you don't really realize it came from bad sources. And they got you because you've already spent that damn million dollars. Ain't no way you're giving it back out of your coffers. They got you. So there's only two things left they have to totally control us. They won by getting us hooked on mobile phones. Hell, I'm part of that problem. I, with all the stuff I've you know, created for mobile phones, I feel very bad about it. But we're, we're addicted to those things. So the two things they have left are what? Our food supply, which they're currently testing the limits of right now. That's why you're seeing stories about eating bugs and eating earthworms and all that other crap. They're testing it out. That's all. And then our money. And if we go to this digital currency and they're already testing out our food supply, we are fucking owned. Yep. It's that simple. It doesn't matter what you do. And if you don't believe how bad this is getting, go to places like in Oregon, where in your own home, you can't even collect rainwater. You can't put a barrel next to your house to collect rainwater so you have a backup water supply it's against the law homeowners associations seem very innocuous let's call them dallas texas going across the country and the homeowners associations have rules you can't grow a garden what and if you try to grow a garden they can find you and repossess your house and right now the usda the federal government is doing this program, oh, we'll help you do a wonderful garden. They want you to register your garden. And why would they want you to do that? They want you to register your garden. And why would they want you to do that? There you go. (laughs) I'm telling you, we're headed for for a very serious collision if we don't use our heads. Stand up ourselves that's i i created a website called make woke go broke because that's what we have to do so make woke go broke dot click i did that because you don't understand when we're buying stuff when we go into kmarts and walmarts and targets and all this crap your dollar splits all these different directions and so a certain amount of walmart money is going to do critical race theory which is teaching our precious kids that if your skin's not dark enough, you're a racist automatically, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're buying X dishwashing detergent, let's say. Part of their money goes to critical race theory or Antifa or all this other stuff, and then or Black Lives Matter. And then you find out the 11 companies that have pushed these together, like BlackRock and Vinrock, are pushing them all together. They pushed all our consumer economy into this, and our, our money 
fuck George Soros. George Soros is 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 a pimple on the ass of a gnat compared to giving money to what we give. We're funding this shit. We just sent billions of our own money through our government to what I believe is a you know, mal administered, selected, not elected government currently, but they're sending billions over there. It's it's legal for the government to send billions to a foreign country. But that foreign country, once they get it, can do what they want. They can take that money, send it back to the United States, to charitable organizations, and then turn around and give big checks to the politicians. And that is not illegal. And Zelensky today asked, his ask today, he now wants $1 trillion to rebuild the Ukraine. Oh, jeez. If we print a trillion dollars for Ukraine, why why were we even helping them? They had nine chances with NATO, and they are dirty as can be. They they steal children and do that adrenaline thing over there. And on top of everything you said, Big Pharma, who runs all of the media stations, all but those commercials. Have- what do you think? Who do you think they're listening to? Big Pharma, because that's what keeps them on TV. So Big Pharma is part of Alpha, Google, which they are, which is YouTube, which just falls into everything else. If Big Pharma They're says no, connected. that means today we're not talking about the vaccine. We're not talking about the border. We're going to talk about whatever. UFOs today. All of a sudden, there's UFOs. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've always believed in UFOs, but the fact that what all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, we that we have sightings of UFOs. If that's not a diversion, I don't know what is. We have so many psychological operations going on to awesome. keep us looking different places from what's real. The reason they'll throw teachers at us saying, "Oh, we're just minor attracted people," and a and a three year old can decide to have sex. That's just they're, oh, okay. they're keeping us distracted. Yep. They're keeping us distracted. The current mail order maladministration we have in D.C has printed more money in its last two years in office than all 100 years of our mint. Now, if you and I wanted to go overthrow Karakistan or wherever Borat is, right? And we want to go overthrow the country, Borat. right? Just because we love their swimsuits with the two little hands <laughs> poking out of the bottom. You know what I mean? Oh, no. Anyway, we're going to go overthrow the country. <laughs> By the way, that wrestling scene in that movie is gross, isn't it? Uh, no. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, at least if we need a little help, if, if we need a little help over there, we can go get some stem cells shot somewhere if we need it to look better. Well, that's true. <laughs> you can, the way you, the way you overthrow a country, just like what they did with Saddam, is one of the things you do is get control of their money. You counterfeit the hell out of it, print a buttload of it, and drop it into the market. Why? So inflation goes through the roof, and then the money becomes worth nothing. Now let me reverse that to you. This current mail-order maladministration in Washington, D.C. has printed more money in two years than our last 100 years in America. You know what That this, is a CIA tactic to destroy a nation. Yeah, it is. And you know what this reminds me of? Like, v- verbatim. It's like China says, hey, so-and-so, oh, you want to run for president? Here's $300 million. Interest free. Oh, sir, would you like another hundred million? Sure, interest free. You sure, China? No, we don't want anything. Two, three years later, hey, buddy, I don't want my money back. I don't want any interest. But remember that 300 million I gave to you to get you in here? I need this, this, and this done. I don't want any money back. I need this, this, and this. That'll be all and leave. Oh, you need another hundred million? That's exactly how it's done. Right. And it just repeats itself over and over and over. And that's. To me, yeah, is what's happening now. Market. Now, the you, largest note holder in the United States of real estate property is China. Now, isn't that something? They hold the most. They hold the most paperwork on loans for our houses. So They're they, the real backers in these banks. They technically own our notes. So they own our notes, and they are the ones who gave us the right data on COVID. The China proctals were the correct proctals, not the USA proctals. And that's what Dr. Malone had used then to tell everyone, nobody take it, and now is using to make a shot to counteract if you had gotten the vaccine that he made with bad data, 
He's now developing a shot that if you had gotten it, it would counteract it. I've heard I've heard a little bit about that. Um, I uh, I haven't taught in in in. No, I was never political, guys. I mean, my my job was marketing and technology, and that's what I do. But I realized when something went, I knew things were wrong in 2016 and 17. I knew the media was about to flip, which they did because of Trump. <laughs> but I knew shit was coming. My job is a patent guy. My job is to see the future, what's going to happen 10 years from now, where I right now can patent and understand how it's going to influ influence the world. So I knew this stuff was coming. When I saw what happened in 2020 on the newscast, I knew that I had developed new technology to combat this with audits, and that's why I did it. But all the writing is on the wall. Now, part of what I was doing before I did this is I actually developed the triage program of how to keep COVID away from our shores. Before I had to really dive into this and work away, it was all my medical companies. I have a lot of medical patents. And I actually wrote the triage program of how we can stop this at our airports from coming into our country. We got to move fast. Therefore, I had firsthand dealings with the CDC and BRICS before Fauci ever popped up. And I could never understand why these people wouldn't make any fucking decisions. It's because they never planned on stopping it at all. They never, never. planned on stopping it. Never. Everything was shut down at every turn. Everything that could have really been done to protect our nation wasn't done. While they're reporting up to Trump, oh, we've got it. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this. Well, he's the CEO. He can't inspect every freaking thing. They were setting him up the whole time. They did. And Dr. Malone, the guy I keep referring to, said exactly what you said. He said, whether you like Trump or not, to conspire against a sitting president is just evil and wrong, period. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Now, what I find interesting, you were a treasure hunter early on. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You, do you know the story about that started? No. How to start? I was my dad, who's like 89 now. What's he um, what's he eat that he's 89? I always ask that. Uh, it's just the, it's just the, it's just the way he was raised. The family ate out of the garden and, and hunt it for most stuff. And Gosh. my I still would have it till, until this year. I would still have a hard time tangling with my dad. I wouldn't want to do it because he's one tough <laughs> military son of a bitch. Right. <laughs> and when we're in the field doing. uh uh treasure hunting which i'll talk about in a minute he runs my base camp for me but he just this year finally had his, his knee blow out and replacement it's just not going to work for him but anyway so my dad comes from a very healthy family my grandparents all lived into their hundreds my great grandparents and uh, all that all lived into their hundreds and he literally um we would all get togethers in summertime and we were at my aunt's ranch because I'm one of almost 350 grandkids and great grandkids, okay? Because my, my own grandfather, my dad's the youngest boy, and his father was born in 1895. So my own grandfather was born in 1895. That's how old and long my family is. My grandmother's youngest daughter, who just passed this Thanksgiving weekend, unfortunately. Sorry to hear that. Very sorry to hear that. Thank you. It was the, she, my grandmother's youngest daughter, my Aunt Susie just passed, was the same exact age as my grandmother's first child's firstborn. Wow. <laughs> wow. That, so my grandmother's that's a firstborn male. Right there. Yeah. My grandmother's first male, they're so spread apart, and she had so many kids, <laughs> that my grandmother's firstborn was now a married male, made his own family, and his son was born. And which is my aunt's and they're technically cousins, but that basically means my grandmother's first grandchild is basically within weeks of her last child she had. Wow. Right. That's, so that's amazing. Not, I come from a massive family. Right. That, that is absolutely And so we'd amazing. all get together uh, at the family ranch and it's at the convergence of these rivers. And we're on the Texas treasure trails where all the Spanish came down through the treasure trails and that. 
Camino Royal, all of that stuff, you know, bringing gold back and forth during when the Spanish were exploring the United States, Cabeza de Vaca, uh, all of those people, right? So one day, we're where the river comes to our family land. We got a, a, a highway that divides the family land, but the river runs along the side. And at that time, I was the city kid. So I was skinny and wimpy. Don't let this throw you. I'm a, I'm a nerd hiding out in a biker's body. I have a face that makes it look like I want to beat your ass, but trust me, I don't. But when I was a kid, I was a skinny, scrawny, little bitty motherfucker, <laughs> right? And so I was the city boy. And I, I hated my feet touching the bottom of the river, right? All I could think about was fucking snapper turtles are going to eat my toes off, right? So I was a you pussy. When was you a bougie motherfucker. You're all bougie. <laughs> you were bougie before you made it to L.A. <laughs> and so imagine this highway. And so this, we got this highway going through and it, it comes over the river and the slopes of the highways down. And so this is very early 70s. And so think Farrah Fawcett. Right, the red swimsuit stuff, you know, Garrett. Planet of the Apes, all that good old shit time. And so the the chicks would all lay out on the city chicks would come in and all lay out on the side of the highway in their Daisy Dukes, which were appropriate then. And you didn't have to have them take off their shorts to see their punani. I mean, it was just there for you to look at because there's a little bitty strip, right? And so I stayed obviously, on the side of the highway, and I'm like eyeballing Pumani. Well, my cousin, Aubrey, who's more like my brother, he's much older than me, and he was just a, a big dude. I swear he was six foot when he was five, which is a joke. But he, I mean, I'm talking Tom Sawyer dude, right? And so he would climb to the top of these uh, cypress trees over the river, you know, the big ancient cypress trees. He'd cl climb up to the top of the tree, and he would impress the girls with his Tarzan yell. You know, he was stud football player and all this other stuff. But we were at, young. And so I was six and he was almost 10. And he's up in the tree and he does his whatever somersault because he's studly even as a kid and hits the river. But he doesn't come up. And I see these bubbles and I could swear I heard him scream. And so I'm thinking, as the pussy I was, going, fuck, the turtle got him, right? Because that's all I could think of. Because it was so deep, you couldn't see the bottom, even though the water was clear. I'm thinking, oh, fuck, the turtle got him. Your friend's dying, about and you're worried about time. the damn turtle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. right. That's all I could think of. Shit, that turtle got him, right? <laughs> I told you. <laughs> money, uh, money bags come floating to the top of the water. Money bags. You've never seen so many... Uh, big Buffon, uh, what was the hairspray, fishnet hairspray, what it was called, you know, the, the chicks would have on their hair to make it stiff, fucking hop in the river, start get, grabbing money back. Aquanet, right? Aquanet, Aquanet. Aquanet. There yeah. you go. Thank you very much. Aquanet. That's what my sisters and everybody used. No big old stoofy, you know, fair faucet hair to keep the wings out there, right? Like the flying nun hat. They just oh, went. Yeah. So they jump off in the water. Because these money bags, are there, they start gathering them up, and my cousin comes up, and he goes, there's a safe down there. And so he's diving back down, and what it happened to be is there was an armed robbery, and the armed robbery gang, let's say, are ripping down this highway, worried about the cops. And so they decide to take this uh, safe that they'd stole from this place and chunk it over the side of the inner path overpass and make it hit the river and they'd come back for it well i guess they missed and it smacked the side of the overpass which kind of broke the door open and then it went down in the river and then it fell on the closed door and that's what my cousin found why can't i and get so lucky like it made, that <laughs> it made the paper uh out of all of that it was a bank robbery bank robbery loot of course we didn't get to keep any of it it made the the local paper and we got exactly one coupon, although I didn't really have anything to do it, but it was the two of us. We got one coupon for a Whataburger hamburger. That, that, that was the reward? That was the fucking that reward, the a reward. hamburger? <laughs> shit. I... Whataburger hamburger, which was the shit, the sizzle, you know, in, in Texas. So that kind of hooked us. Now, we had always been running in the mountains and stuff. I mean, we live outdoors. And we were constantly finding Indian artifacts. We would find uh, conquistador artifacts. Oh, wow. 
we found a cave once, got into the cave, and in the cave, got up, got up into it and underneath it. And when we got into the cave, there was an old rusty shovel and a hole, square hole, would have been dug out and something taken out. So we always knew there was treasure out there. And so that's how we got the bug, right? To this day, I'm in my 50s. I can't walk outside. I never look up and enjoy myself. My fucking eyes are glued to the ground and the rocks, the clues, right? So I don't enjoy myself. But what happened is after my big technology, I, I was one of the first technology unicorns out there. So it's it's 96 or 7, I started doing my patents. Um, 98, I knew that the, the internet was really coming. We didn't, we probably only had, a hundred thousand internet users in the entire United States, most of them being corporate. But I knew this thing called the internet was going to be big, and so once I understood that the internet actually communicated with numbers that are masked by words, right? We don't remember your DNS server, or your IP address, because we're enumerate. Like we're not going to remember one eighty three dot oh one dot oh two dot oh five, but you can remember Yahoo.com. So words mask numbers. And so one day I had the epiphany that if words mass numbers aren't all of us and everything we buy numbers to begin with, you know, ISBN codes on books, records, and tapes, barcodes on grocery store items, crack open your VCR, whatever, you see the serial code on the back, your driver's license, social security. And so that's what I created the platform most people now refer to as Q codes or QR codes, although QR was Dentsu Wave owned by Toyota, but it was only inventory. It didn't mean anything. So I made all barcodes talk to each other in one big old database and make them a, a transport system, not a loaf of bread, one buck in your Kroger grocery store. So I built what ended up being one of the very first billion dollar companies, but I did it all privately and hadn't even gone public yet before I had a billion dollar valuation. And so it was a huge run. Wall Street's writing about me, all the papers writing about me. And then the dot com crash came. And we all got clobbered. I remember being in the chairman's office of Goldman Sachs. I'm 33, right? Um, worth a billion dollars, sitting there talking about it. And he goes, Son, what's going to make your deal not work? And I said, You. <laughs> which he didn't like, but I told him the truth. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you're fucking taking stuff like C. Everett Coop, right? Uh, Pets.com, rusty fucking garden cool.com public. They have no business being public because they have no business model. And I said, that's going to come crashing down on every one of us. He didn't like me telling the truth. He ended up running the SEC for Obama, by the way. But oh. all that came crashing down. I got caught in the middle of it. So one day, uh, I, I lost everything. Uh, you know, we we were getting ready to go public. It was uh, supposed to be a, uh, April 9th, um, 2001. Not that I remember the date. You want the time in seconds? Anyway, I, was, I would know it too if I were you. <laughs> and we couldn't, you, you go public and you're really doing it in the spring or October. You really only have two windows. Those are the big windows for it. And why, and so why is that? Me, why is that the window? It's just when the markets are conducive to more buyers and leverage. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just when market makers are active. And so people get a spring boost. The way stocks were made then is it's really through market makers, which is about 30,000 people that burn up the phones with investors saying, this is the next big, 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 right? They're called market makers. That's how it all used to work. And so the two hot times for that to go to reach people, catch them at the right time is spring or like October heading into the fall, but there dare not be November, December. And you got to do spring because you don't want to go when everybody's on fucking vacation, right? right? So that's that's why you have those two windows. And so the markets start to get soft April 1. And I know this is a long story getting treasure hunting, but you got to understand how I got to it. No, it's great. And so I uh, we have to wait it out. Markets get soft. Now at that time, my company burn rate, which is the amount of money you're spending on employees, right? Your burn. Mm -hmm. My burn rate's $9 million a month. Whew. That means if I don't bring in $9 million. You're in the red. 
each month. I can't even pay the bills, right? And so I got $9 million a month burn. My home office is in Dallas, Texas. I've got an office in Manhattan at Rockefeller Center. I've got an office in Hong Kong. I've got an office in Los Angeles. I've got an office in London. And unfortunately, you had to do that crap to be sexy for Wall Street. I never understood it. It's not that I wanted to do it. Your bankers begin to tell you what you need to do to look right, right? I ran my previous company that was going public. I ran it for years. I always ran it triple-digit growth, no debt, no matter what. I didn't know having no debt was a liability going public. You got to have debt. So it, it kind of changes everything. It was a racket. Anyway, and so everybody's talking about going public. We're going to be big. The markets get soft. Our next chance to go public is going to be in October. Hmm. Of course, not 9-11 happened. Oh. And we lost almost all our bankers. Um, had to lay off everybody. It was horrible. I would never wish it on anyone. You love these people that you grow companies with that help you grow companies. You know, right? That start from your initial five to your initial 20 to your initial 200 till you finally, you know, you got thousands of employees, but they're still your people. Your day one people. And it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Okay. Right. And you're, you're building something and yet, and, and we had hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts. But the way the contracts would mature, they were introducing the new technology, which you now see everywhere. But then they were introducing it in magazines like, you know, Time and Newsweek and, and Forbes magazine and all this other stuff. And so we just got caught in that weird window. And so one day it's poof. And so I basically lost what would have been $4 billion went yeah. in an instant of 9-11. That was it. We had to shut everything down. There was no way I could save my company. Um, but Gates offered, Bill Gates offered $50 million, but he wanted half of the company. The devil himself. I was, I was, I, I was sitting with the sizzle. Steven Spielberg was one of my investors. Congratulations. Right. There was nobody in the world I couldn't get to. Right. Aww. Because I would walk in. My biggest problem is I'd walk into a newspaper company to show them what I'm doing. And the fucking executive of like Knight Ritter magazines and newspapers, one of the biggest ones in the world, pulls me aside after me and says, can I come work for you? Right. That it, it wasn't that we it, we never even asked for investor money. We just, just showed them what they like, yeah. threw money at us. Right. Uh, I my first person I showed was the Dallas Morning News because I'm doing my radio show and television show in Dallas. And I'm teaching people how to use the Internet. That's what I did. So I was Fox News's internet correspondent and I, i'm doing this wacky television show about the internet i went down to dallas morning news and i said I, I i got a meeting with the board and i said can i show you something i'm working on so they called the meeting and here's the chairman of uh Bilo, who ended up being the chairman of the associated press wow. and they're sitting down and i got my laptops and stuff and i said i want to show you net technology i created and i want to see if you'll just run it in the newspaper and they said, why? I said, because the newspaper is the shittiest print on the shittiest paper. And it's a barcode. And so I need to see if this can work on the shittiest print and the shittiest paper. And they go, okay. And they go, well, what is it? And so I had to give them a little device that we had to create. It was a free giveaway. We never sold the devices. I said, plug this into the laptop and then pick up anything in this boardroom. And so invariably, they pick up like a can of Altoids or Coca-Cola or a water bottle. And I said, okay, just swipe the code and they went boom and all of a sudden their computer they swipe a coke boom boom and there was coke and they're like holy shit how did that happen right because we're having to type this shit in and i said that's what i did i've just turned it all on so they said okay what do you want us to do and i said well i want to do a one sample newspaper not for the public but for me because i got to test this crap on newspaper it's the worst print in the world they said okay they said but are you taking investors i said no because it wasn't. They said, we want to be your partner in this. Will you let us put a million dollars in? Now, I'm sitting here with the chairman of one of the largest broadcast and newspaper countries, companies in the world. And they say, will you let us just put a million dollars in? We don't care what the terms are. Let us put a million dollars in. I said, let me think about it. So I'm leaving Dealey Plaza. You know, that's where JFK was shot. Yeah. 
my office is at the north end of town at that time in Dallas. So I'm going up the tollway. I get to my office. The phone rings. It's Bilo again. We've decided we don't want to put in a million dollars. Now, uh, I wasn't upset about it, right? I didn't ask for it. They said, we want to put in $10 million. Hmm. <laughs> True conversation. <laughs> we want to put in $10 million. And I said, man, you have to let me think about it. I mean, I'd love to have you as a partner. They said, look, Jovan, we've got 20 newspapers, 20 television stations. We're a multi-billion dollar company. We'll drive this shit home and make this stuff the best there is. So I said, okay, let me figure it out. Let me get the attorneys on it. So I get the attorneys on it. Then I get another call from Bilo, and they say, we want you to go meet our banker because mm. they have their own big M&A banker. And this was a banker that was at, uh, ING Bearings uh, Bank. Oh, Bearings. So I fly to New York to demo to the banker. Well, this guy's a big wig, a real big cheese, right? I come into his office. I sit down. He says, hey, my buddy's here. We're going to go to lunch afterwards. Can he watch the demo? And I said, sure. The reason they wanted me to meet the banker was because they needed to put it under an investment umbrella, so the banker needs to do the transaction. They said, look, he's not there to approve the deal. He's just there to see it so we can put it through the investment arm. So I went and demoed it for him. Hmm. And so I did the demo. The guy's socks were blown off. Again, grab any, any fucking thing in your office. It's got a barcode on it, right? Bottle yeah. of water, your thermos. It doesn't matter what it is. Your right. notebook, right? Right whatever's got a barcode right. on it. Right? Boom. Scan right it. on the cup. Yeah, I don't know if you can so, see it, but right. it's right on the cup. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water. It's Fiji water. This episode is sponsored by Aurora. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, this crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this, those who have had their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aurora, who is sponsoring this video. Aurora is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all into one easy-to-use app. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aurora for free for two weeks and see if you or anyone in your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial today. Go to aurora.com slash MSCS. The link is in the description below. Yeah, I, I can actually see it. Yeah. And so they're scanning any normal barcode and they're going, holy shit, because their computer's just going bing, 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 and it's loading this stuff up. And so the banker says, okay, I get it. He says, what do you need? And I said, I need a really good rock solid president. I need to find somebody who's capable to be my president. He says, maybe I can help you with that. I left, getting ready to leave uh, during the day. I get a phone call. It's the banker. And he says, I got somebody who can be your president. Oh, boy. And I said, who's that? He said, well, you know the guy that was sitting in the meeting? What you don't know is he was the president of Warner Brothers. Oh. And, I think, and I think he should be your president. He digs your shit. This is going to be big. So he, ha he handled like Roseanne and Ellen, and all these other shows. So I said, okay, well, have him come, I'll stay over. Have him come to the hotel, sit down, we'll talk. We had a meeting. I talked to the guy. Uh, he had run HBO and all kinds of other stuff. I mean, impeccable credentials. Another Harvard fellow. Uh, this banker was a Harvard fellow. And the guy didn't even use email. Okay. Right? He was the type of guy that would have an assistant print it out. Hmm. And I look, I'm just transparent. I'm going, I can't have you be the president of my company, even with this great track record, when you don't even use the internet, you don't use this stuff. I, I just can't do that. And this is internet based. 
Right. And it's internet based. I mean, I, you need to have somebody has some basis in it, but these were wall street guys, big wigs. And he felt really dejected. And I got a call the next morning or I got a call that night from the big investment banker. And he says, what did you do? Do you understand who you're? And he said, how do I say that good guy is going to be the president of this company and run it when he doesn't even use this shit? He doesn't even really even understand the net. How do I do that? He said, okay. And I thought it was going to sour the deal. He hung up. I got a call two hours later. He said, come over to the office. I went over to his office. He says, I found you another president. I said, okay, who? And he said, me. <laughs> now, this guy had even better credentials, but this guy was a massive mega banker. And I said, done. He says, now what can I do for you? I said, I got to have a great board member, and I, I need to meet with Michael Jordan. Now, we're not talking M. Michael J. Jordan, jump shot Jordan. We're talking Michael H. Jordan, Michael Hoopshot Jordan which is the guy that was running CBS and all these other things, Westinghouse. I'm talking Mr. Credible when it becomes a board. He eventually went and, and to Frito-Lay and then ran Dr. Frito Pepper. He's now yeah, Dr. deceased. Pepper. And, you know, I remember right, reading Dr. about him at Dr. Dr. Pepper. Pepper. Yeah. But he came in, and so I'm, he said, stay overnight. Well, I say no night. Now, here in front of me is Michael Jordan. And in the business world, this is the cheese bomb, right? Your this is the Michael there. Jordan of business, right? A business, Weston House, CBS, all this. I show him the stuff. Michael Jordan, this is how business is done. I'm in. There's no thinking about it or people. So he goes, what can I do for you? And I go, I need a rock star board. He goes, who do you want? I said, I want Steven Spielberg. Two days later, I'm sitting at, at DreamWorks with Spielberg, Katzenberg. Geffen couldn't make it. Damn. Steven Spielberg's looking at it going, holy shit, this is going to change the world. I'm in. Wow. That I, was my life. And I thought I was right? cool because I that saw it across from that in L.A. I was at a L.A. Lakers game when Kobe was playing, and I had bought floor seats uh -huh. for a year. And my seat was right. across. I was right across from Jack, uh, Nicholas, and Steven Spielberg. So uh -huh. they, they had the same seats every game. I was on the yeah. left side. They were directly across, and I thought I was cool. Right. <laughs> you guys, you was there. That you had is to awesome. with them. Congratulations. Look, networking. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, without ever asking for money, my deal became the hottest thing, and we raised $205 million cash to fund the company out of nowhere. Congratulations. So like I said, we didn't make our offering. We got hit in the... Uh, the dot-com bus, 9-11, everything crashes, everything went gone. I went back with uh, my board, bought all my patents back, which we matured, and it's now what you see today. But during that time, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out why would God give me so much incredible talent and the ability to use it to just have all this go up in vapors. Now, God didn't bring me to my knees. He, he brought me right to my fucking chin and my nose, right? Belly flat. And I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do? Now, you have to understand, once the Jets went away, and once the Hollywood Friends and the restaurants and the Academy Awards and all this other shit went away, and I just won the Laureate Award. Oh, right? you mean, oh, you, mean like you realize that they weren't your friends? Oh, when no when you're not on top, all of a sudden they disappear, huh? Wow. It was gone. I mean, I'm talking like that, bang. <laughs> and the one that shocked me the most was my wife. Ugh. Yeah. She went. Now, I kind of knew that one was coming. Yeah. I won't even get into that story. So she split. Her boyfriend moved in with her three weeks later. I got a brand new son who I raised, and I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do. Good for you. And I knew I wanted to write books. But what I decided to do was attend seminary, believe it or not, and to study ancient Greek and Aramaic, because I'm a language and books and theology fool, even though I have a dirty mouth. But as I'm doing this and looking into writing books, my family owns an aggregate business. Aggregate is the road aggregate stuff, mm -hmm. right? So the mountains we grew up in, the hills we grew up in, were being mined out for road aggregate to build highways. And I had already owned various sapphire mines, 
gold mines, platinum mines, et cetera, because I was always in that kind of stuff. And so I go, look, I'm a technology guy. And patents are all about research. When you try to do a patent, the patent office basically says, screw you. It's not an easy process. There are 11, 11 million 600 patents in the world. 1.65%, we're talking a little bitty sliver slice, ever make money or ever get licensed to become useful to mankind. Luckily, my 95% of the body of my work is in that 1.65%. So I've done interesting things. Some of the things I've done is when you drive through a toll booth and you don't throw change anymore, those are my patents that connect all that stuff together to make it work or how your phones auto update or how cable auto updates or all this other stuff, right? Yeah, we're pulling up uh, I some of your patents right now from your website as you're talking. We're pulling them up. Yeah, I have I you know, I have stuff that people told me was crazy and you're probably too young to remember, but when we first start and you got to remember, we're in 2022. We only got our camera cameras in our phones in like solid 2006. It's not that long ago. But I knew it was coming. So when we first got smartphones, you'd look at a web page, you'd have to slide left, you have to slide right, you have to slide up and down, because the page wouldn't fit. I knew that if this was going to work on mobile phones, we've got to develop code that can tell you're on a tablet, can tell, and there were no tablets yet, can tell you're going to be on a tablet, on a desktop, or a mobile. And it's got to auto size. Those are all my patents. Just all kinds of little you know, stuff like that. Those are heavy but patents. But since I'm a researcher, Javon, so when you, <clears throat> those are heavy patents. I mean, those are thick patents. For people that don't know, when you go to submit a patent, what's the process, right. or should I say, what is the hell like to submit it, get it approved, pass, so on and so forth? Good question. Um, I see you have quite a bit of experience, so I thought it'd be a good question to ask somebody yeah, who's got a million dollars. You know, most people in their lifetime, <laughs> Most people in their lifetime maybe do two or three patents. I do, on average, about 100 a year. <laughs> and the, the patent office is not your friend. It's, the re, it's, it's why I can do these audits. It's the reverse of a murder case. In the patent office minds, if it was a murder case, they say, you're a fucking murderer. Prove to us you're not. Because you write a patent, and they're basically – they throw – case law and stuff at you say, but you're infringing on this, you're infringing on this. And they'll throw hundreds of, of these things at you. And you have to be able to defend them. And you have to prove to their attorneys, nope, I don't infringe on that. So it's continual litigation. It's called, uh, 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 what I actually am by trade is what's called an IP prosecutor. You <laughs> prosecute them just like a case. It's called patent prosecution. Unbelievable. And so in most people's lives, it takes six, it takes six, seven, eight years to get a patent granted. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be of value. My particular technique of how I do it and why people, when people want to do patents and stuff, they'll tend to seek me out to help them or figure out how to do it. I usually can get a patent granted through the patent office in about 12 months and have major teeth in it so you really have something as value because people patent the thing and i don't ever patent the thing i patent where the money's going to come from i'll give you an example how i beat barcodes have been around and this is how i got into treasure hunting i'll get there barcodes have been around since the 1970s i didn't create barcodes barcodes are the most litigated multi-billion dollar punitive damage suits in the world when I started writing my patents about using a barcode as a communication device, not a data, uh, database device, I had to write around 6,600 patents that already existed. And I wrote around every fucking one of them. Wow. And in the barcode world, everybody got sued for the Lemelson patents. They came to me as a 30-something said, how the fuck did you figure this out? Because they, could they couldn't do anything to me. I wrote around it all. You got to understand how the system works and how to do it because I patented the money. Let me give you an example. They were in the business of barcodes. If you think about a barcode, it's very antiquated technology. So 1970s, right? I realized that what is a barcode today will become something readable by a device that we know that is that's not even created yet, right? And so I realized 
don't call it a barcode. Call it a machine readable code. So the first thing I did is I called it a machine readable code. That immediately lifted me out of the barcode space, where wow. a barcode meant inventory in, inventory out, 99 cents, grocery store only talk local. I was the opposite, talk to everything and only mean a destination out there on this thing called the web. And since I understood one basic thing about the internet is you're always going to use some sort of browser. You cannot get around that. You're going to, doesn't matter what you do, you got to enter an address to say go. And that technically is a web browser. So my killer patent was using a machine readable code to mean a destination on the internet, using a machine readable code to open a web browser and fetch the most stupidest thing, but you reduce it down to very stupid things. Because if I would have focused on certain things, you can work around them. But when you understand where the money comes from, meaning you understand this as a marketer, if you don't put their ass on the website, you don't get fucking paid. Right. So I understood if I can't make this code, go to a website, we don't fucking get paid. So I've got to own that little simple trigger that does it. And what is it? Does it use a, use a machine readable code to mean a destination on the web. It's unbelievable. But nobody can work around you. Everybody has to deal with you. So in most people, it takes years, but you, you, you have to think offensively and defensively at the same time. And if you have something you want to patent, never file one patent. Cover all bases. You got to look at it as a portfolio. You got to file several. You got to file several. And I learned this because when I was 20, Two, I had built what became my first billion dollar company. And it was in the windshield wiper space. And everybody copied the windshield wiper space design that I was doing, revived the entire wiper world back then. This was 88. You weren't born yet, right? Oh, I, yeah, I was six. I was six. Okay, so you were you were a whopping six years old. Yeah, I was jumping off couches like American. What was that guy's name? American Hero. He used to have the star. I was jumping super, off the Supermaning couch. off the couch. Yeah, yeah Superman well, off the couch. Okay, so this was eighty eight. <laughs> I was I was a young kid, but I I had my talents and faculties then. Investment bankers brought me in, and I figured this thing out. And so what I learned was my first big fight was every single automobile manufacturer tried to clone the design and the function and all of these other marketing companies tried to clone the ads and designs because i wrote the ads and the copies and everything and so i helped perfect uh what's uh you know the landom act on protecting your copyrights and trademarks so i cut my teeth and i got a good reputation young let me kind of go backwards so patents are not that hard if you understand how to do them but you don't patent the thing, you patent the money. And here's why. If you create a widget and let's say it's a microphone holder, I'm looking at your mic arm, you got a socket, you got the arm articulating arm. What people don't know about patents is you could patent that and a patent requires you to reveal your formula of how you make it. That's why Coke's not patented, it's copyright and secret. But in patents, you're revealing how you do it. If I come in and I make at least 13% changes to how yours is made, I can file a brand new patent. And so you have to understand, once you teach the world to do new things, you're gonna, everybody's going to copy you. Good example. I'm, I'm young and dumb. I'm 20, 20 years old. I guess I'm 21 years old when I did this. And Radio Shack, we used to go buy our bag phones from Radio Shack, right? And you'd mm -hmm. pay... You pay uh, $2,000 for your phone, or yeah, you pay $2,000 for your phone, and then you would go get a separate cellular contract with a, with a separate cellular company. They weren't together. And your cell phone bills back then, believe it or not, if you were even a mild user, your fucking phone bill was $2,000 a month. Just ridiculous, right? And so I got to looking at that industry, and I go... And Radio Shack was my partner, which became my partner in scanning later. I go, well, you're selling your own phone and you make it you're, you're make it for cheap and you sell it, the carrier. And I learned that the carrier gave them a grant 
Wow. And then gave them revenue stream off all the phones. And I go, wait a minute, you're getting like a thousand dollars plus because they went over to this carrier. I said, tell you what, fucking give the phones away and have it go with the plan. You're going to get your money anyway. Right. And that's, that's how it's done today. It makes sense. You want to get people in? Fucking, we'll give you the we'll give you the phone. Yeah, which is how it's done today. You have to understand where the money is going to come from, and where the mechanism to close is going to come from, not the item itself. So, long story short, when all this stuff is done, my wife's left me. She's bebopping her boyfriend in my fucking house and my fucking bedroom. Three weeks later, and when my son goes to visit her, right? He's two years old. He's calling me two, 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 he said, Dad, there's a man in, in your bed. I said, you go tell him to get out of my daddy's bed. Which he did. <laughs> get out of my daddy's bed. Anyway, tell him. Which, which I've learned. Hey, if you have an ex-wife, let me tell you. If you have an ex-wife, here's how to do it. My ex-wife changes boyfriends like clothes. And so I've learned to deal with this. So when I'm somewhere, now my kids are grown, but when they were small, and I would go to a school function, I learned right away. I'd walk up. And she'd be with a boyfriend. I'd stick out my hand. I go, "How you doing? My name's Satan. You've probably heard of me." <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. Note to self. Yeah. And he, and the guy that is would great. Fucking laugh I'm his ass that off. We become quick buddies, and it would piss off my ex-wife. I said, "Just embrace it." Hell, you doing now? My my name is Satan. You probably heard of me. He goes, "I got an ex-wife too." Anyway, that's so the clip. That's the clip what, of our whole. In it. Forget the QR code. Forget the the, the station. <laughs> forget the the election thing that you develop. The treasure. That's the that's the clip. <laughs> that, that was it, right? So, look, I'm a researcher. I got an analytical mind. When the Spanish came to the Americas to take gold from the Americas. Back then, they literally took trillions of dollars of gold. Trillions. But here's the kicker. Gold in that time period was about $6 an ounce. Not 2000 like it is now. We're talking $6 an ounce, right? And so that those trillions of dollars, one-third of it, only one-third of it made it back to Spain. One third of it got lost along the way here in the Americas. One third of it got lost in the oceans. It's still out there. So if you look at where gold sets today, there is approximately anywhere between 14 and $30 trillion of lost treasure out there. Now, what makes a treasure lost? It means they mined it, so there's a record of it. It means they refined it, so there's a record of it. They minted it, bars or whatever, there's a record of it. They loaded it on a ship or stagecoach or whatever, there's records of it. And somewhere along the way, it got lost, robbed, or stolen, sunk, or whatever, right? But you've got records, follow me? Now, the Spanish are phenomenal record keepers, freaking phenomenal freaks. And so I get the bright idea that I'm reading some of these ancient legends and I could go into the archives in Seville, in Spain, and I could hire somebody who spoke the right Castilian as they did and scour the records and find where the Spanish, because they were meticulous note keepers, would say, we found gold here, but it wasn't enough. Now, let me explain, wasn't enough. They would find a, a chunk of rock about the size of an ottoman. You know, you put your feet on a yeah. square one, right, on your chair. And that would be a one-ton rock. And if they, at their, their point in time, couldn't extract $200 of gold, they didn't fuck with it. It wasn't rich enough for them. It was too hard to extract. Now... If you understand that their strike price was about $6 an ounce, and they needed to find 200 ounces of gold, right? Uh, we'll just use simple math and call it 15 ounces of gold, right? Well, what they used to have to get $200 had 15 ounces in it. Now for us is 300 grand. 
And I'm going, that's a no fucking brainer. I'll go fucking lick that rock for 300. You and me both. I was just going to say, where do I and, get a scuba suit our at? Mining company. Yeah, our mining company, our mining companies don't even have strikes that are that valuable. And it was all hidden in the archives. And so what happened is uh, my cousin and I, right, Aubrey, the one I told you about, it's like my brother. We decide to tackle one treasure legend, but now we have modern tools. So you have to understand the names that they named them then. And I'll just use a stupid name. You don't have Big Bear Mountain. And then all of a sudden you go there. But this fucking Big Bear Mountain's 500 miles away. You got to understand mountain ranges didn't move. Names moved. And so you got to do all of this word derivative work to understand what they called it. And then they always wrote about landmarks or Indian tribes or features. And so what we did is we use a triangulation method, three by three by three. We have to find the treasure story at least three times in history to know it's true. If it's a one-off, it's shit. I'll give you an example. There's a, I've written over 300 treasure books uh, teaching people how to go find these things for themselves. There's one other treasure yeah. legend guy. I think 300. he's written 70 books. Right? He did. And yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's about 350 books or something like that that I've written on treasure. I've got them in every state. But one of the other top treasure authors, he's written 72. He had this one story in it, and I found it, and it's one story. And I finally called him, and I said, let's, let's talk about this story you got. He goes, what do you want to know about it? I go, it's a Jonah Hex comic. He says, no, it's not. My research, I said, it's a fucking Jonah Hex comic. It's a story from a Jonah Hex comic, and you put it in your fucking butt, and you didn't verify it. Of course, he got pissed off. And so you got to be really careful about this, because you got to understand, you got to find three original sources for a treasure legend. You don't want derivatives. You don't want people making it up. So you got to find three original stories. And then we got to find three, some sort of way bill or witnesses, meaning real people, not Two-fingered Tony Cactus Jack, right? right, right. You got to find real people that exist. Now, if we can verify three people in the story were really human beings that existed on this planet. So now we got three original stories of the same treasure. We've got three human beings that we know are real. The last thing we do is in the stories, you got to be able to derive the three geographical markers, like it was the mountains made this little whoop de doo or we were looking for this kind of angle of a tree, or it was by this river. Those are geographical landmarks. But the the ability today to use Google Earth, we can hit the ground without hitting the ground. So if we can triangulate these things down on map, it's about 99% research work, 1% boots to the ground. So the very first one we tackle, the very first one we tackle, is to be in this ancient canyon, out of nowhere, a mysterious rock cabin built into a cliff, and here's where all this stuff is to be. And we hit it, bingo, first time out, by, by triangulating it. And so we found this big thing where this happened, where the gold was, what it was, the whole bit, the people, and we go, wow, we can really do this. And so what I did is I took a lot of military people, police people, uh, intelligence buddies and stuff like this. And we repurposed a lot of military people and forced responders. And we put together a treasure hunting team that we focus on terrestrial based treasures. And all I did was start writing about it and start publishing videos about it. Cause you know, people like to follow these things, but this is all funded with my own money. You know, we got when we get on the road, we have all this fancy equipment stuff. And my my father runs my base camp because we'll be out in the desert, you know, a month at a time. You know, I tell people, if you can eat beans and rice every fucking day and wipe your ass with cactus, you're probably <laughs> made out for that. Right? But we're living in the field. And we're having to protect millions of dollars of equipment. And we're running into drug runners all the time that want to steal our equipment. We're all armed to the teeth and loaded. Uh, we're always finding dead bodies. And nice. eventually words start <laughs> getting out. And then I got a phone call one day from the producers uh, at the History Channel that's saying, look, you actually really do this truly. I mean, you're, a, you're not only a writer of treasure stories, legends, and tales, but you physically have, have a team that 
does this. Will you help us figure one of these things out? And that particular treasure was the Oak Island treasure in Oak Island, Nova Scotia. Very well known, been talked about for over 250 years. Uh, John Wayne was involved. Errol Flynn was involved. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was involved. But it's a killer. It's killed a lot of people. And I'd always wanted to do it, but it was on private property. So you, you couldn't really do it. And it just so happened that some brothers bought the property. History Channel called them. History Channel shot six shows and knew they had a hit, but you can't, they didn't know really how to execute on it. So they reached out to us and said, hey, can you really, really teach us how to use technology and treasure hunting, whatever? And so we came into that show, which most people know. It's called The Curse of Oak Island. It's the History Channel's number one show ever. And it's been on for 10 years now. And we came in as season two. Our only job was to really bring the mechanics of trying to figure out what this particular treasure legend is, if in fact there's a treasure there or not, um, which is what we did. We brought in uh, our expertise and group and contacts that scanned the, can the Titanic. This thing has an 18 story drilled hole into the center of the island. And this thing has swallowed and killed people. Wow. And uh, we were the, because my two professional divers, which is a husband and wife team, are cave divers, which is a pretty unique specialty because most people die doing it. So we were the first people in history to successfully dive in it and extract out and not die, uh, which, and it's now involved into its own season. It's still running, but that's the difference between Television's a different thing. Like, you know, I've done Science Channel, History Channel, Discovery Channel, you name it. There is a decided difference between what you see on TV and what's real, right? And I can remember when the series, the, the series had about a million viewers, about 100,000 viewers when we came in. And they brought us in to do season two. And instead of doing six episodes, I think we did either 13 or 14 episodes. Wow. And we brought the real equipment and style to it. The show went to 8 million viewers and became the big number one hit. But I remember the day before it aired, the producer called and said, look, you did a fantastic job and we love you, but it's going to look different yeah. than what you remember. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so this is where this myth came from that I hunted for the Ark of the Covenant. You know, in my election stuff, one of the ways they bash me is he was a hunter for the Ark of the Covenant, blah, blah, failed treasure hunter. I never, ever hunted for the Ark of the Covenant. And so where that story myth comes from is I'm sitting in this war room and I'm educating these island owners on the history, the artifacts, and why the area in the island is truly very unique and that's why where i do a lot of work like graham hancock it's not about treasure it's about seeds and yeah. weeds <clears throat> that's what he kept talking birds, about seeds animals yeah. and <clears throat> and glyphs and languages and all this stuff and so i'm trying to educate these brothers look you got something here that's incredibly special but i want to let you know right now it's not what you think it is and so in that room, which was like a six-hour presentation, I'm actually discussing that right up from the island, but up mountainside at the harbor, there was an ancient cache of coins found. A cache means a stash, not one or two, of Carthaginian coins. Now, Carthaginians, these were from the Punic War, which is basically North Libya. And these were found there. They were found by a freshwater source, so, and, and they had all of these ancient glyphs in language. So I'm saying, look, here's what we're looking at. You see all these glyphs along this cliff? It's all ancient Libyan. And you see these coins? These coins are ancient Libyan. These were truly found here. And when the guys would get off a ship, they would bury their money. They didn't fucking carry it around in their pockets. And I'm saying, so what you're looking at is truly an ancient mariner spot. And it's very ancient, but it's not fucking pirates. Like you're saying, there's a pirate treasure there. 
And so I have to take them to the history of ancient mariners, which is not taught in the United States, that ancient mariners, all the way back to the time of Troy, the time of Hercules, as you would put it in the correct tense, we were sailing the globe. Javon, was that around? And uh, all of these was, was Plato around, around then? <clears throat> I'm sorry, was Plato? Plato was around then. Wow, okay, so that goes back to them. Phew. So ancient Greeks all, all sailed the world, right? All of them sailed the world. And I'm saying you've got something really special and unique here. So in doing that story, I have to explain to them how does Nova Scotia, Canada, which is where this place is, how does it all connect? And where does Nova and Scotia come from? And how does it connect to the Bible? How does it connect to Jeremiah? And it was Jeremiah that took the biblical artifacts when the Second Temple went down. And I'm explaining that story. And television decided to make a promo on it, just like you said. That's our promo, right? Hi, I'm Satan. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> they made a promo of me saying the Ark of the Covenant. Fuck. And that's what these writers write about, that he was a whatever, whatever, whatever this the Ark of the Covenant. But, yeah. it never, but it never was. It was edited that way. And they did it for a TV promo to get viewers. And it did what it needed to do. It went from 800,000 viewers to 8 million viewers. But that was the extent. Otherwise, it's all private exploration, and it can be anything. It can be looking for lost cities, lost civilizations. There's more stuff out there than you could ever imagine. Um, treasure's fine, but you're always going to battle to keep it. You're always going to battle to keep it. I've watched other contemporaries in Ocean Treasure find $2 billion only to have a government swoop in and take it from them yeah, okay. after they excavate it and got it. Yeah, away. after they do all the work, risk their life, after everything they, they else. Do all the work. Now, when you're doing that... And so I, a large part of my stuff was exploration, but that's how I healed myself from a dot-com crash. I ended up with a 38 in my mouth. I came very fucking close to pulling the trigger. I decided I had enough. My whole world crashed. My wife was fucking nagging at me, telling me the whole world's going to hate you. You're the most hated man in America, whatever. Yeah. I grab my 38 out of my gun locker. I walk into my bathroom. I put the gun in my mouth. I turned around. I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm a mouse butt hair away from pulling that trigger. True story. And I happened to take that last breath like this, you know, like... Like, and I said, tell my son, I love him. I was checking out, buddy. I was done. Wow. And I did this kind of last and I'm in the bathroom and I'm, I can see her in the mirror standing behind me and she's smiling. Huh. And that is, why is what caused me to set down the gun. No, I'm, I ain't fucking giving you this. Yeah, I'm not going to make I you happy. She was pushing and pushing, pushing for a reason. Well, and I just took it away from her. I said, fuck you. You're not winning, right? Thank God I did. Now, what? No, I won. I, I stayed above it. Yeah. But you're going to take your kit. Look, likes are great. Shares are great. Followers are great. But to, if what you got, what you got to do is you got to find what you love and hope you're blessed enough that you actually do what you love. Because if you do what you love, you don't fucking work. You never, right? you never work a day in your you life. In an, right. You work. You have an incredible life. You have great stories. You have great potential. You can fake it till you make it. But look, I'm a welfare baby. My mom was a prostitute, addicted to heroin, drunk, who died of AIDS. Sorry to hear that. I started out in government housing. There's no reason I should fucking be here doing what I'm doing. But I, I understood early on, if I was just willing to do it and hoof it, I can get it done. And that's it. And I'm dumb enough to believe I can do it. And stupid enough, I don't take no for an answer. Now, when you were out and there, that's it. When, when you're doing the treasure and you're out in these places <clears throat> and you're seeing this, how does it change your mind? Because now you know, you know, I can talk to Graham Hancock. I could talk to whoever. I could see data that's pulled up. But when you're out there and you see it or, or somebody brings back something and in front of you, you see something that's so, so old. And I would imagine just from me talking to them, I would imagine having seen it, touched it, you look at reality a different way because it changes you. It changes you, it right? It changes you to the core. Because just talking to I'll give you an people, example. Yeah. 
Right. Walk into a room or a cave that somebody hasn't set foot in for 4,000 years. And here's their shit and their fingerprints. And it's just like, holy fuck. And then you realize we've been through this before. Yeah. And then you realize you're holding something in your hand that was probably their most prized possession. And then you also learn the biggest lie of all is our history is totally wrong. It's horseshit. Horseshit. Total horseshit. horseshit. Total horseshit. It's a total lie to imprison us. We've been here longer. Here's what I tell people. you: If you want to know the truth about history, go watch Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Mm-hmm. And they'll say why. And I say, in Beyond Thunderdome, there's these kids off in this little fucking canyon waiting for the recorder. You've seen it, right? Yeah. And have you watched Beyond Thunderdome? Yeah, okay. I have. Yeah, I have. And so it's got Tina, yeah, Tina Turner in it. It's got these kids. And they have this whole oral history made up. And it's because Earth went to hell in a handbasket. And they were remembering only parts, and they got it all jumbled up. And at the end of the movie, they find ancient skyscrapers and shit where we destroyed ourselves. Here's the reality. We're not it, fuckers. We're Mad Max's kids. We're only the survivors. That's right. That is all we are. We have, we have forgotten more than we ever known. Our single largest earth mover in the world can move only 70 tons. That's it. 70 tons. And those are those big fucking tractors that have the tires the size of an apartment building. It can move 70 tons at one time. However, you go to Baalbek in Libya and you have cut stones that are 10 stories high Two football fields long, they're cut and they're fucking stacked. And they're perfect. They're perfectly aligned. Flawless. So flawless. So after my opinion. So we have lost more than we've ever known. You know what I think happened? And I want your opinion if you don't mind. I think we went this bullshit technology route. All this hardware, software. I think civilizations in the past, they went with vibration, sound, telepathic, because I say this at nausea, but it, right now in our life, our reality, our time, if you take an electric razor, you put a battery in it, it vibrates, it moves, right? If I put it on the table and I hit, hit it on to shave and it's vibrating, it mm-hmm. moves. Why is it out of why is it out of this world to believe that if that can happen, if it can move, if you have a hundred thousand years to develop things, why is it impossible that you couldn't move a seventy ton rock? by vibration if you have a hundred thousand years what do you think a dog just barks for no reason i think that's a mindless person i think they were never desensitized so and they still use instinct so why is it insane to believe that they can telepathically move shit why is it insane to believe if they have a hundred maybe five hundred thousand years that they didn't see something coming and got the hell out of here i don't see why that's so crazy to believe other than they don't want to rewrite history Look, what was our planet to start with? Nothing. Think about it. No, 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 no. Don't go biblical on me for a minute. Just think of our oh, planet. Me, I won't. <laughs> Who, what were the original, well, biblical, you know, you say out of ether, nothing. That's why I said, think about our planet and think about what do we know as our most ancient inhabitants that were actually really here? We dinosaurs. don't know. Would you agree? I'm sorry, dinosaurs. Huh? Uh, yeah, but dinosaurs. Do you understand? Yeah, we can agree that you, you and I can agree that dinosaurs were here, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so our planet at one time was a pretty fucking hostile place. Yeah, right. Yeah, you were more likely to be pooped out of the ass of the T Rex than you were to survive to the age of ten. Right? Yeah, agree. A hundred percent. So some, so something changed our planet. Something changed our planet. Now. What we know changed our planet and killed the dinosaurs was an ancient asteroid impact. And people don't use logic when they think about this. We got these fucking scientists. They only can kind of think one way. And they'll see all these dinosaur tracks. And they'll go, oh, this must be an ancient dinosaur hunting ground. And look, it was small dinosaurs and big dinosaurs. And it's got the zigzags. They must have been hunting them. But the big dinosaurs are all in a straight line. They weren't hunting shit. 
the small dinosaur tracks are all in a straight line. The zigzagging little bitty one is going in the same path, and all their t toes were pointed in the same, same fucking direction. direction. So if we back off off this planet, and we look at all these uh, footprints around the planet of dinosaur tracks, where we see them moving in herds, why are they all pointed the same direction? One side of the planet's coming this way. One side of the planet's coming this way. They're getting the hell out of there. They were fucking running for their lives. Yep. How do you make a fossil? Does something just die and lay on the ground? How many fucking coyote and armadillo and raccoon fossils are there out there? Idiots. Zero. <laughs> what makes a fossil? Right. Something has to get caught, dead or alive, has to get caught in such a massive impact of shit that it instantly encases it, it buries it, and it pressures down on it so hard that it eventually becomes what's called a pseudomorph. Means mm -hmm. as it will still decay, but it doesn't decay and create a void. It just starts sucking minerals from the earth and it replaces all the bones and shit. It's called pseudomorphing. And that's how it becomes a fossil. And so people don't understand this shit. Our history's wrong. 100% wrong. about this stuff wrong. I'll give you an example. I bet you I could go and you could beam me a thousand years in the future. And I could explain how our civilization died. So bear with me for a moment. I love this shit. I could, I could come with this story and I could prove it scientifically. So imagine me beamed a thousand years in the future. And I'm saying our civilization died because we were drowned in oil and they go oh my god is that what happened to your people and i go i can prove it and we dig and we dig down through these layers and sure fuck enough we find about six inches of oil soaked gravel and rock plain as fucking day right there down in the dirt and I go, let's keep on digging. And let's say if we dug 50 miles and that same six fucking inches of gravel and oil is there. See, the whole planet died with oil. And I could sell that. Oh, now, yeah. what I'm really showing them is a fucking blacktop rope. Right. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> right? And they'll believe you it. They'll write the books. They'll have every fucking thing you can imagine. <laughs> Unless you right. patent it all, right? <laughs> They picked this shit out of their ass. That's why the archaeological community hates me. Oh. Because they're, they're, this story came out, and, and I hit the airways because I called the archaeologists out of it. They said, we found these ancient, vitrified uh, altars of sacrifice. First off, everything isn't a fucking sacrifice, you idiots. But it's an altar, and it's been vitrified. Here's what vitrification is. Vitrification means the ground has been baked with heat. I'll go, okay, these are fucking altars. They're two inches off the ground. So these were prostate layout altars. Yeah, because they're vitrified. I said, no, you're not, you dumb fucking ass. They're molds where they would pack down the dirt, do the design they want, and pour the fucking molten level uh, uh, metal in it to make the shapes, you fucking idiot. And that's what gave the heat. They didn't bend down and, bear, and pray to these things. See, everybody has to have an angle. It's an ancient civilization. It's an ancient this. It's an ancient name. Because that's what's up for grabs. But if you really if you find anything that goes against the the approved government truth, <laughs> it go it go fine. it goes against uh, Lewis and Clark. You know Lewis and Clark textbook. It goes you know against what there, right? Yeah, discovering America. Yeah. Why did one of them commit suicide by putting two bullets in the back of his head? Did you know that? No, I didn't. Most people don't know that, right? Why did it? The government claims it was suicide. Oh, jeez. By two bullets to the back of the head. No, it wasn't. He actually, when they went west, found ancient things that weren't supposed to be here that explained our country had super ancient inhabitants, and that fucking word couldn't get out because we were supposed to be, it wasn't about Indians, we were supposed to be a blank country that was vacant that we could take over, and we weren't. That It, it is so mind-boggling to me that these scientists, they go after Graham, they go after you, people like that. When we know nothing about this podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch. 
has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, or go to MonsterEnergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the Beast, Monster Energy. About our history, and our history is our base. If you don't know our base, you don't know anything. You know, when we're just talking about one ice age that got hit, you know, we could prove seven at least, you know, so right. who knows? Who the hell knows? And for them to just dismantle it and whatever, what what I think they don't realize is those civilizations were in touch with self, the universe, nature, and everything else. So when, so say you and I were out killing bears every day and you pass away, mm-hmm. we don't bury you. You're, you're in touch with nature, the universe, everything. We preserve you. You know, we put you in a tomb. We make sure that you're good so that you're there for the next generation and next generation. And then, then with this whole dinosaur shit, I guess they never like went into the caves and looked at the drawings. They all have some type of weird, especially in multiple countries, they all have weird reptilian shape heads. Now, what did they just pull this out of their ass and decide to, to draw a, thing that looks like a dog with a dinosaur head on it. You know, I, I'm being funny, but you know what I'm referring to. Let me, let me give you a quick bit. Who in modern times, what city in the United States discovered the most mummies? Uh, and we're talking bona fide fucking mummies. I would say Antarctica, but it can't be. No, it's St. Louis, Missouri. I would have never and in guessed. in St. Louis, Missouri, where they have all these ancient caves. St. Louis, Missouri. I would have never thought there was and, even a cave there. In the there. 1800s, they wow. go in these caves, and there are thousands of mummies. Thousands of mummies. We're not talking mummified people, meaning dried out. We're talking wrapped fucking mummies. Where the fuck is that in literature at? States of America. Where's that literature at? Huh? Where's that written at? They hit it. They Mother put them all in the street. They burned every fucking one of them in the street. Now, how That's you a find disgrace. some of these accounts That's a disgrace. Is, I'm dead serious. They burned them all in the streets. Recently, another one I had attacked. They found another mummy in the United States about eight years ago, and I got notified as soon as they found it by the sheriff. They cracked open a cavity in a rock. There's a fucking mummy there. Even before we could mobilize, they shut it all down, made everybody not talk. Why? The best chronicler of ancient giants and ancient mummies, Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. He wrote openly about them, that they were real and true. Have you seen the footprint over in South Africa? No. Okay. So imagine, so we'll go back. Why are they hiding the mummies? The why, why are they so against the mummies? Why are they burn them? Why, why are they it's hiding because them? Because it, it's a manifest destiny. Motherfuckers. Wow. Okay. It's called prior land claim. The Chinese were here. Huh. I, could, I could tell you stories of the Chinese sailing the globe with... Wooden ships bigger than our aircraft carriers, but they can't let any of this come out because in the United States, specifically, we have a manifest destiny issue. In order for the right setup, it had to, quote, be vacant, and you can't acknowledge other civilizations because of prior lamb claim issues. Do you hear this shit? <laughs> right. My, I'm so saying to my engineer, do you hear this crazy ass shit? You know, he's my engineer's there's back here. Yeah. There's some of the most amazing stuff in the world out there that when you really get into it and you do your homework, but here's one. In South Africa, there is a uh, sandstone field. You know, sandstone's a pretty soft rock. And sandstones, that's why you can see sandstone rocks and they have ripples in it because they were once muddy and beach, right? So you'll see the little ripples in it. In Africa, they have where the sandstone, when the tectonic plates hit, it was already sandstone, but when the tectonic plates hit, it broke the plates. And of course, that's what pushes up a mountain, right? Volcano. And so as it pushes up this mountain, here it comes at the bottom, here comes the stone, and it's jutting out of the cleft. The only problem is, in the sandstone is a footprint. And the footprint is 
totally human. And you can see where it put its foot in the sand when it was soft and muddy because the foot slides and it has the buildup like on your toes when you push it in the beach, like on the sand, oh. right, yeah. is there in the stone. But the other fucking problem is the feet, footprints are six feet tall. Six feet tall. Six feet tall. Fuck. So much for that four the foot two thing. In, huh? The ancients in, in Africa pray to it as the ancient Nephilim, the ancient gods. And in Genesis, the book of Genesis, it says the ancient giants, the ancient ones, the Nephilim. So here's why, none, here's, I'm going to tell you why. It's, it's a very simple mechanical reason why this can't come out. So I just talked about the Nephilim, which is the men of old, which the Bible mentions. Now let's go back in time. If we were to go back into the even mid-1800s or early 1800s, you're at your university level of learning. You might have 30 people out of any one state had the luxury of going to college. Okay? This was part of my stuff in Nova Scotia. I'm showing them languages that their universities they even had there. It hadn't even, the language hadn't been decoded till the 1980s. So I'm saying, and here it is. Yeah. They just didn't know about it. And so you had this problem with the universities then, Harvard, Yale, any of them. What was it? They were Christian institutions. They were all church run. And the base study was theology and the Bible. So now you have this movement that comes after Darwin that believes we evolved from germs in the water. And there was a big split in the academic world. There was Darwin's partner that says, we have a creator. We were created. We are ancient beings and we can see it, right? That's mm -hmm. why you can, chimps and man share 99 point three or 99.7 percent of all the same chromosomes same but the point three yeah. percent difference mm -hmm. is 240 specific genes that do not occur anywhere else on our planet that's how unique we are mm -hmm. which means we come from elsewhere anyway so institutions Agreed. used to be christian institutions to begin with so when darwin came along who was uh, an agoraphobic, he hated traveling, he hated God because he hated his life, and he set out to disprove God. His own partner and his own children say this. So Darwin came up with the, the theory of evolution, survival of the fittest, to fit his, what his story wanted to tell, and there was this big clash academically, right? It'd be like critical race theory now. You're too white. You're a fucking racist. You were automatic, right? Right. So think about that. So the big clash then was Darwin's partner that's saying we have a creator and Darwin that says we come from Amoeba. There is no God. We evolved. Well, because of press at the time, Darwin won. It's that simple. And in that one move, all of our higher learning institutions moved away from being uh, theologically based and became secular institutions. Now, as we evolved in secular institutions, then it became cool to be an atheist, to hate God, to be a communist, to be a Marxist, all that cool shit that the academics get to be. So where we set today is the following. None of the academics, none, in any of the big institutions can acknowledge their six fucking foot real human footprints in this stone. Because it would destroy everything that they said. Millions of years old. Because here's what happens. If they acknowledge it, then two things happen. Their archaeological uh, degrees are useless. Wow. And two, they would be codifying the ancient records of the Bible that there were, in fact, Nephilim here, and they are not going to fucking do that no, under sir, any circumstance. And that is the sole reason, like for Graham Hancock's work, that's the sole bit why his work's monumental. And that's why the system will not embrace it, because if the system embraces it, it will by default codify the Old Testament, which is the Talmud, in Judaism, I'm a Messianic Jew, 
and they're not going to they're not going to codify anything that is religious and that's the epic battle we're in right now good and evil good and bad right stuff for mankind or control mankind tell you the history and let you fucking deal with it i don't i don't care if we were fucking worm sperm and turtle eggs and that's what made us i can still live with that because i'm here and i like what i am right and i want to know but they always got to have this battle and pit everything so that's that's why this these stories don't get out they kill them well think about it like we were talking earlier <clears throat> you know when graham was in graham had to wait seven years to come out with what he knew and this is just the guy who went to school and he's into you know ancient shit he goes right. on his own dollar to the amazon Spends years there with Randall, and they and because the government will come fuck them and take all their shit, right. they gotta hide everything that they know. They gotta hide it. The million years that they have proof of that human was cooking, they gotta hide that for seven years until they have a facility built hidden where oh, no wow. one's gonna mess with them. Now that is insane. That's right. Absolutely insane. If you find it, if you found a treasure right now in Florida, you went out to the beach and found the treasure. Number one, the government would take it away from you. If you don't tell them about it, you go to jail. So what do they tell you to do? You got to go into the government offices and they want to know what's there, where is it located, how'd you find it? You got to give it all to them. They get to take it all over. And then we get a coupon. And they put together to go excavate it. Yeah. You don't get a fucking thing, and they claim their new discovery. We found this ancient ship. That's what a fucking racket that shit. It, it, it's like the feds. So the state does all the work, right? They find the criminal. They do the investigation for three years. The feds say, "Oh, he had ten million. Ah, we're taking it for all that work you did for five years. Hand it over, right?" <laughs> that's the deal. Now I got a bit. Now in oh, relation to this, upside down. I got a big question for mm -hmm. you, and I, I, I think you'll have the answer yeah. I'm looking for. So. You know, say 1996, there's no iPhone. Maybe there's a BlackBerry. I can't remember when the BlackBerry, say even before that. It's now been, That's before BlackBerry. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's 96 yeah. before. So how from, say, let's just use 96 because we used it. How from, how in five years do you go from a car phone where every, when I was a kid, my friend Franco, his mother had a car phone. Everybody wanted to go in Franco's car because he had the car phone. We were cool. You know what I mean? The big, big ass thing. Within a matter of what? Five, seven years, we have iPod, iPhone, all this other shit. Do you think that's from reverse engineering of an extra, extra terrestrial UFO craft, whatever, that we were able to reverse engineer some of it to then be able to create the technology we're using today to some extent? I have a, I just always had a hard time believing how quick it happened. Well, you're 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 on the right hunt and you're making the correct suppositions. It's just your timeline that's off. The iPhones and it's because you're a young guy, it's just true. Yeah, yeah it looks yeah. very fast to you, but that was a a manufacturing leap which only had to do with we had better manufacturing and better substrates and truly that we learn to read silica and write silica right oh. which is sand yeah right sand. so manufacturing is what the x the exponential growth in miniaturization that wasn't reversed engineer now let's go backwards in time if you go back to and you believe the roswell stuff and we look at the roswell alien crash timeline I do find it very, very curious that right after Roswell's crash happened but didn't happen was a weather balloon but was real, was when, as a country, all of our communications changed. We understood we could get to cellular. We understood we could get to wireless. We understood that we could send stuff through fiber. We didn't know you could send stuff through glass, which is the precursor before silica, which led to silica. So all of the advances that we made, made one quantum leap right around that time of the crash. Now, so we'll take that, the 50s or Roswell, whatever it is, put a pin in that. We can go back to the 1830s. Little House on the Prairie shit, right? 
And I can show you inside the Indian nations, when they would do raids in towns, one of the most valuable things they liked to take was called ledger books, which are your grocery mercantile books where they just write the shit in it, like mm -hmm. Mr. Olson on Little House on the Prairie writing the shit. Yeah. They loved those things, and they loved colored pencils, right? And all of the Indian nations, you can even take the Pawnee, you take the Plains Indians, you can go back to ledger books that have been around since the 1830s. And what do you find in those fucking ledger books? Drawings of natives greeting, being greeted by men in little saucers with lights that damn look like exactly what they did at Roswell, but this was fucking hand-drawn in the 1830s. So that tells me, just, just using that alone. See, I do not believe there are depictions, like you talked about the, be the beings in caves, and you talk about the heads, or maybe what they call the Thunderbird people or whatever. What you have to understand is those glyphs that you might see in Nevada, you might see in Arizona, not only do you see them in Nevada, Arizona, you see them in about 60 fucking countries, the same fucking thing. Mexico being one of them. I was shocked when I right? saw that shit in Mexico. They're all over. And so there's two pieces to that. It's a common history we shared. And petroglyphs and drawings aren't fucking doodles. They're only drawing what they saw. And they're drawing it as true to the, the, as they can to what they saw. They're not making up theories and doodles. It isn't fucking Digbert or Dilbert or whatever the fuck it is for, you know, caves right. several hundred years ago. It is, they weren't recording in books. They were recording it on the walls and they were telling their story. And that's where they brought people and they told the story. And here's who we countered and here's what we did, whatever. The bigger question is, and this is what archaeology does not allow. Archaeology, like I told you about these gold coins found in Nova Scotia that were Carthaginian coins, a sack of them. Archaeology's explanation for that is somebody was on vacation. <laughs> oh, my God. And they had ancient coins in their pocket, and they fell out of a hole in their pocket. Could you come up with something and then you better? Go, come on. You got to be able to come up with something. They do. I'm telling you, no, not you. I mean that. They do. They, I know. They all of Jeez. Thing. That's what they do. They say all of these things are just coins out of the pocket. And I go, and they magically fell into a hole that was had to be dug for three feet. No, they just fell out. That's their piss ass explanation for this stuff because they can't embrace it. I'll tell you what, and if they if they hit that hole, awesome. Javon, they must have some hell of an accuracy. We need to we need to find right, them right. and get them into sports. The They're in a bag in a hole in their pocket, <laughs> right? Big ass jeans. I don't know about you, but I know when you're on the beach walking down the beach and you're and your little, you know, banana hammock. I know you carry around a couple 3,000-year-old gold coins, don't you? Everybody does it. Yeah, right? when I drop it, I'm not going to go look for it, right? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, there's, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this gold coin worth $50,000. Yeah. Yeah, I just think I'm going to have it pressed next to my nuts when I go swim at the beach for good luck, right? Jeez. Archaeology are fucking idiots. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all of these symbols right. are all around the globe. Yeah. And they 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 refuse to tie them together, and they refuse to acknowledge them. And for those glyphs and symbols, they said, well, that was just spontaneous. Everybody kind of came up with their own. Are you fucking kidding me? Everybody had the same dream, the same image at the same fucking time period. Are you fucking idiots? All over the world. because they can't embrace. Right. John, Javon, all over the world. That's right. <laughs> because they, if they embrace, if they embrace that somebody or some people or multiple peoples circumnavigated our fucking globe in ancient times, their archaeological fucking college degree is not even worth toilet paper. It's not even worth a trash bag, I was just going to say. Yep. That's right. And that's, why they, and that's why they do it. And it's the biggest racket there is. And I'm, I'm tougher than Graham. I'll call him out. I'll tell him like it is. I said, the bottom line is why you're pissed is because you paid fucking $200,000 for your education, which ain't worth shit. And you're not using one way, bit of it. it. This is called this is called the racket of peer review. Do you understand how peer review works? I do. I do. But explain it for everybody. You're going to be an archaeologist. Yep. Do what? I said if you could you explain it. Review. Yeah, if you could explain sure. it so that everybody understands it better than me explaining it. You don't want here's, me to. Here's how it works. 
Let's say you watched Indiana Jones. And you go out and you find the fucking Temple of Doom. And you find out that it's 10,000 years old. Now you're excited because you got motivated by Indiana Jones. And so you write up all your discovery. And you hustle back to your university. And they have said, in order for it to be a valid find, it must be peer-reviewed and published. Now, what is peer review? Peer review means you got to go to 10 people in your profession. They are your peers. They look at it, and they approve it. And when they approve it, it will get published. Now, here's the kicker. (laughs) If it's not the approved history, you ain't getting fucking peer-reviewed because all of those motherfuckers think the same exact way. That's what a peer is. And if they can't get their heads around, you just rewrote history, it ain't getting published. And that's how they suppress it. And that's how they suppress all of it. It's a racket that keeps it in this little narrow thing. And they convince you that's well, you're not published. You're not peer-reviewed. You're not peer-reviewed, so that can't be real. You haven't been published by this publishing house, which is only going to publish what the fucking agenda is. And I don't like your collar. I don't like your collar you have on today. We all have white button-down shirts on and a a black uh, sports coat, so I don't like it. Go home. We're sticking with our writings because we're not changing what we wrote and what we studied and paid 200 grand for. Fuck history, even though that that could probably save us. Well, it would say yeah, us. we could learn stuff in we, the future. Lost stuff. I actually like, what do you think? An asteroid isn't going to hit us again. <laughs> like, what is it? What are they it's not coming anymore? <laughs> it's all, yeah, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. I, and I think that'd be a brilliant way to go because it'd just be it and over and we'd be out of here and there wouldn't be no suffering. That'd be it. That'd be that, fine. That's right? it. Quick. Boom. It's like that kid. Did you see that there was a 25 year old working at a John Deere plant, uh, just before Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. and it was a John Deere plant where they're smelting iron uh, for making, for making the big heavy steel parts of the tractor. And he didn't hook up the little safety belt and there's a vat and it's 2000 plus degrees and he fucking fell in it and vaporized instantly. True story. Look it up. John Deere factory. Even, even uh, Jay Leno money can't uh, fix that one. Just could you imagine that? No. Well, at least it's quick, though. It's real quick. Yeah, that would be quick. It's not like jumping off a building. You know, jumping off jumping off a building gets quick. You know the last thing that goes through your mind when you jump off a building? Scientifically proven. Not, why, why? What's the last thing that goes through your mind when you jump off a skyscraper to kill yourself? Tell me. What is it? What's the last thing your you think? Asshole. Your asshole. Your asshole. What, that you're going to land on your asshole? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My luck, I jump off and I, I land on like a... I, a cell phone tower or some shit that like was bent and be right up my ass through my neck and everybody would take pictures of me and that would be it. Yeah, that guy MSES Media, he got a cell phone tower up his ass. <laughs> uh, last, last two things, I know you're busy and I want to make sure I could talk to you again. No problem. No problem. Uh, want it and then uh, your other invention. <clears throat> what do you see? You know, you're you're a. You know, I read all your stuff last night. Uh, you. It seems to me that you look at things differently than the average person in the future. You know, we have the metaverse, we have this, we have that. What do you think is going to be the next bang? You know, the, the, you could call the metaverse a bang, but to me, it's not a bang yet. Cause you know, not every, I don't, I'm not walking around looking at everybody with metaverse glasses on. I see everybody with a cell phone. What is, what do you see being the next big thing that everybody has like the phone or the computer or, Something I can't even imagine. Right. Um, Without giving too much away. No, no, no. You understand I do patents, right? Yeah, that's why I said without giving too much away. You understand if I tell you now on your airway, I have to fucking kill you, right? Okay. (laughs) You're talking to the one guy. But you don't ask that question. question. (laughs) I try. You know why? Because somebody will fuck you. It's very smart. But let me tell you why. And the inventors don't know this. If you have an invention and you're working on it and you go to a meeting and you pitch people and you don't have the right legal documents in place, a barrier. it's like all these incubators they do for these kids. Hey, throw us your ideas or whatever. The moment you pitch it in an open forum without the right legal documents, you have technically given away your idea and you can no longer enforce it 
And the patent office goes, you talked about it, which means you authorized it, and we're not entitled to enforce it. So as much as I would like to tell you what the future holds, I'm telling you right now, the future is amazing. And there's some pretty amazing shit coming down the pipe. But it would be something I couldn't tell you over the air. We'd have to sit down and execute a document. But I'd be happy to have a discussion of what the future is going to be with you. Well, actually, Javon, I just asked you to give a lesson to everybody that if they're doing patents, not to say anything because of what they could do. Do you like my bullshit to get out of that? No, I know. No, it's, it's just, <laughs> do, you, do you like my cover up for the question? The patent's done. <laughs> You're giving it away. Look, if you look, if you. I can't tell you what the future holds because I am one of the people that innovates that future. And by the way, here's what's interesting. I don't look at anybody else's shit, so I don't care. That's the best. And you should. Right? You shouldn't. Yeah. Because I because I have to I have to be pure, right? You have to be zoned it's in. It's just on. like in the audits in Arizona. It, it's just like all the audit works I do in Arizona. And you know, my stuff will be in the Supreme Court and I've got to talk with these judges and stuff. You know what I don't do? All the other people talking about the audits and podcasts and stuff, I've never watched any of their shit. Good for you. Why? Because I'm the one that will be sitting there in a court of law, and they'll ask me about that stuff. And I have to be able to honestly say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Never seen it. Yep. Because I have to main pure. No influence. Right. No influence. And then uh, tell right. me about the Kinematic Marker System that you developed. Impressive as kinematic. Hell. It's called kin yeah. It's called kinematic artifact detection. Here's what it is. And uh, Javon, just real real quick. Uh, by nature, I'm a coder. So oh great. Yeah yeah. So I I, I code everything. Override brute force. I know all that shit. I've been doing it for Beautiful. twenty. I'm nowhere like you. But uh, with the QR code, it really interests me because it's all code. You, you know, everything's code, code, right. code, code. Uh, everything's code. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so th this. For my bread and butter before this whole Spotify deal shit was coding. Right. I, I did white right. hat SEO, not the bullshit where you hide the ad symbol. Right. And I say, Javon, I'm gonna right. get you on page one. I put the code in so you can't see the Google ad that I bought. Charge you, charge you, charge you. Really, I did nothing. Then you say, I don't need you anymore, Tommy. And then you're on page 80. I code it where right. if you're on page one, I think you would agree. If you code it the right way and you get someone on page one, unless they're constantly updating, you really don't need anybody to optimize That's your website wrong. anymore. It, it's a scam. That's right. Thank you. Right. Uh, so explain to me the so, uh, no, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so it's called kinematic artifact detection. And here's the bottom line. This is unbelievable. Our elections are, are, our elections are rigged. Our audits are rigged. I'll give you an example. The way they audit election right now, they do what's called risk limiting audits, which is basically shorthand for we're going to limit you finding out what the fuck we did. Therefore, we limit our risk going to prison. <laughs> but think about this. In Fulton County, Georgia, where you have a million cal uh, ballots can be cast like Georgia, right? In 2018, to, to, to confirm that their election was right. How many ballots did they look at? I'll answer it for you. 25. What? Now, how can you look at 25 ballots and confirm anything was right? Oh, no. By the way, the makers of the machines get to choose which 25 ballots you look at. And so what happened, the reason I created kinematic artifact detection, which is a brand new way to audit elections, is I understood all the old shit we do is rigged. Like, we're going to do a recount. What does a recount mean in the current environment? It means that this machine, the little gas station receipt of it, that little ticker tape says that a thousand ballots went through it. So what do they do? They get a thousand ballots. They feed them to the machine and look at the ticker again. And it goes, yep, a thousand. Now, did anywhere in there, did I mention votes and who got voted for? No. No. Just how many? That's the, their definition of a recount. Do you think that's a recount? That's not a recount. That's smoke and mirrors. A recount is like I've done in Arizona. I've looked at 188 million individual ovals. That's a fucking recount, not count pieces of paper. And so I realized the system was broken. And so here's how it came about. I had already been working in nano 
medicine nano analytics and we're talking at the nano molecular level and i'd already been innovating uh in pregnancy tests if anybody out there you know your wife's been pregnant and i know your husband can get pregnant now but forget that <laughs> if your wife's been pregnant okay unbelievable we're living in this world been pregnant <laughs> we're whacked right now so you know what happens is your wife urinates on a pregnancy test and if the line goes blue then she's pregnant now what that is is that's called the chemical reaction uh, based on uh, immunoassay meaning it's looking at the hormones in her urine stream now that's designed for visual acuity meaning it measures through the urine stream, if there's a chemical reaction of the hormone, HCG, it blooms because that's the marker that shows the woman's pregnant. But is a woman really pregnant when it blooms blue? No, she's pregnant at the exact moment of conception. And the moment that egg and sperm collide and the cell immediately begins to divide, her body begins to change even before she sees it in her belly. That's how her period stops and everything else. That's how she gets morning sickness. Those are all markers in the body. But in pregnancy, they'd only figured out how to measure it in the urine stream. And so when it turns blue, it says you got 25 HCG. And so what I spent years doing is working at the nanomolecular level because I believe we don't want to catch cancer when it's a fucking goiter you know, like Fetterman on his neck in Pennsylvania, big old gorder on the neck. That's not when you want to catch it. You want to catch it when it's a fraction of a grain of sand. You follow me? Yeah. And so when I realized that means I've got to devise a way to see disease at the nano state, meaning when it's in its infancy and has just started. So I did this with a doctor out of Harvard, brilliant guy. And we came up with a, not only a way to do it, but we could do most all the tests that you go to the doctor for and you pay thousands of dollars. We can do it on your mobile phone. I bet they love now, you. Mobile phone, that, <laughs> that little bit. Yeah. That little bitty camera on your phone. Yeah. You're talking two or three bucks right there. They want to do it on all this expensive equipment, but we taught this optic right here wow. to look at it and to see. So we could tell in HCG terms, instead of, 25 HCG that a woman was pregnant, we could tell that it, it at 2.5 HCG, that's like a few days after you did the horizontal mambo. And that's a major breakthrough and where these guys compute, compete for a few hours or a day earlier than each other. We go way back, which now so means now we can monitor pregnancy the whole time by just continuing to urinate on the stick. And we can monitor against birth defects, uh, Zika virus, proclampsia, all this other stuff. So I was already working with, I can teach a camera to see what the eyes can't see. That's amazing. And so when all this mailing was being done, go ahead. I said, that's amazing. And I remember uh, during COVID, I was, I have a lot of Jewish friends from Philly. I, I, would grew, I grew up in Philly and I have a lot of Jewish uh -huh. friends. I used to live in Philly. I used to, I used to have an office in Maniac and I, oh uh, I lived at Rittenhouse Square. Oh, you God. know, I know. Oh, I, you, oh, Square, I know. Written out, yeah. I, yes, I do. I, I lived in uh Broomall and I was in South Philly for a long time. Wow. Okay. I, that just blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I forget what I was going to say now. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, I, I, I lost my train of thought. So we're looking at all this stuff and if 2020 was supposed to be all these mail-in ballots, right? So let's talk about a mail-in ballot. You got a sheet of paper handy? Yeah. Right there next to you? Pick yep. up one sheet of paper. Okay? Tear it out of your notebook. Just a whole sheet of paper. What are you going to do a small one? Do a big one. Yeah. Do one whole sheet of paper. Okay, there you go. So you got a sheet of paper, right? Yep. Now, if that's a mail-in ballot, Play like that's a ballot. Okay. Don't write anything on it. Okay. Show me, show me what it would look like if it was a mail-in ballot. It's folded, right? Yeah. Okay. So you got a flat paper. Now fold it. Okay. So now open it and 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 show it sideways. Go ahead and open it up, okay. and show it like a tent. Okay. Uh, turn it down like this. Flat way. No, no, no. Flat, flat, flat. No, no, no. Tip it forward. Oh. See how the fold in it? You see that fold? Yep. Take the, now take the fold out. Okay. 
It's not easy to do. You can't. And yeah. you're about to fold it the opposite direction. Yeah. See, here's what happened. See, paper is fiber. Hmm. The moment you bent that piece of paper, that was it. it does not matter how much pressure you put on it. That fold is not disappearing. It's always there. Okay? Hmm. So if we have a premise that 90% of the people in the United States voted by a mail-in ballot because of COVID, right? Then shouldn't all the fucking ballots have folds all through them? Yeah. You should see two folds because they're long documents. Well, when they started doing these recounts, I noticed, wait a minute, all these fucking ballots are flat. If they're flat, what does that mean? They didn't go through the fucking mail. Because they couldn't have. They Possible. couldn't have. Why? Because they could they come off of press. Yeah. The press prints the ballot. It folds it twice or, or three times. It puts it in an envelope. It's all automated. It presses it again. It mails it to you. When it mails it to you, it's running through all of the presses of the post office. It smacks it down again. Then it gets to your house. Then you open that envelope. And then you open the ballot. Now you've broken it back the other way. You kind of flatten it out. You look at it. Maybe you mark it, maybe you don't. Most people fold it back up, put it in there, wait around, and then they open it back up. But again, they do it. Then what do they do? They put it back in the envelope, send it back to the post office, which presses the shit out of it, and it comes back in. That fold is indelible. It's there forever. You can never take it out. Why were we looking at all these flat sheets of paper? They were telling us we're mail-in ballots that were never folded. And so I said, look, this is an easy one. I can tell you if that ballot ever went through the mail. And it's called kinematic artifact detection. So here's what kinematics are. Kinematics is the physics of movement. It's what you study in a horse's gait. It's what you study in a golf swing. It means movement, dynamics of movement. So what am I looking at? I want to know the dynamics this piece of paper went through as it moved through the system, which I know puts folds in it. And those folds, even if you try to smash them out, are going to leave what? Tiny artifacts. I'm going to be able to look at it microscopically and see fucking artifacts. And what am I going to see? You're going to see all those papers broken. It'll be rough. It'll be funky, right? And even if you tried to fold it the other way, that means you just broke it the opposite direction. Right. Now you got two breaks in it. You got two creases, yep. That's right. And so there's telltale signs that wait a minute, this was never mailed. And then the second part of it is, okay, if you're mailing in your ballot in Philadelphia, man, let me tell you, Pennsylvania, rats ass stuff, man, they did horrible shit there. Damn. But, and that was, well, that was two finger Tony and your cousin Vinny, right? But anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> I think they right? were the other way and because so, uh, for Trump to build that many buildings, I find it hard to believe that he hasn't had a couple of handshakes with them. <laughs> That's right. Right. So you've got here's what you've got. OK, so you've got a ballot. Now, if you're if you're mail in ballot and you're sending it in and vote it, let me ask you a simple question. If that was your ballot, how did you vote it? I went I went to vote in person. No, 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 no. No. But if you were doing a mail in ballot, pick your Mont Blanc back up. Oh, my jewel. Yeah. Your, yeah. Yeah. No, no. You had a you had a pen in your hand just a minute. Oh, pen. It? oh I thought you said Blanc. Was <laughs> I said a Mont Blanc. Oh, I thought right? you said Blanc. Like, Blanc. I thought you said Blanc, like, like marijuana. <laughs> okay, got it. Got my so pen. That's your Mont Blanc pen, yeah. right? You snob. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so when you vote your oval, right, with your fancy foo foo pen, which I love Mont Blancs, by the way, I'm not giving you the shit. They do, right? You, nice. you, you kind of, they do. They're beautiful. You So you fill you fill the oval in, right? Right. And then you take all the ones you want to vote and put it in. Now, I just took you through voting the ballot. So let me ask you a question. If we've got mail-in ballots that are folded, but they have machine-printed ovals filled in on them, is that legit? No, absolutely not. There you go. And so I had to teach the systems, and if you ever want to do this one time, I'd take you through it and I can show you. I had to teach to recognize, did a human fill in this oval or did the machine fill in this oval? Because if this was all a mail-in ballot thing, there shouldn't be a fucking single oval in there, no matter what, that was inserted by a machine. But yet in Arizona, there are 3 million voted ovals that were inserted by a machine. Holy shit. 3 million? 
Three million. And, and that's and what, how close was Arizona? And you got to understand. That was well, oh, Arizona, you got to think about it. You know, a ballot can have up to 90 votes or more on it. Damn. Even in the Sharpie, when I exposed the Sharpies were rigged and all of them said, Sharpie Gates, that doesn't change a vote. That's not what it was about. If you don't use the right paper and you use a Sharpie, it bleeds through. Everybody fucking knows that. There were 126,000 ballots that used the wrong paper where the state made you use Sharpies. First time in history, they forced you to use them, which they shouldn't be able to do. On those 126 ballots, 126,000 ballots, because there's 60 judges on the back, and then you've got like 40-some-odd potential votes on the front. It bled through so much that on 126,000 ballots, there were an extra 2.1 million voted ovals that showed up. Wow. 2.1 million. The deal is it was done to confuse the machine because they need time. If you're going to take over an election, you've got to somehow intercept the paper in the mail, in slot number three, and you've got to have time. Now, in 2020, they said they needed 10 extra days to count the ballots. It was such a mail-in, we can't count them. Well, here's the numbers. The machines counting the ballots would count about 149,000 ballots a day, all of the days leading up to the election. Then on election day, they said that they needed 10 more days for all of these ballots. Well, in those 10 extra days, one day was like 140,000, one day was 89,000, and then it varied between nothing, 2,000 ballots, 5,000 ballots, or, or, or 9,000 ballots. What the fuck were they doing with those extra 10 days? What's now, the, jump forward what's to 2020, nothing? what'd they need all these fucking t extra days for? What's with the nothing? How do you get away with the nothing? That's right. That's right. See, they forget that you, nobody's ever audited this stuff. I audit every single machine, every single transaction. Don't you feed me this bullshit that you have nine high-speed tally machines and you need it all these days when in all of those extra 10 days, you could have run them all in one day. And most of the days, you didn't run shit. So what the fuck were you doing? Cheating. That's forensics. And didn't uh, Texas do it all in one day, which is how many times bigger? Oh, Texas is multiple bigger. Yeah, Texas. Uh, and here, I'll give I'll give you a good one. Let's just compare this. We were talking before technology, after technology. You were talking about you know CrackBerry time, BlackBerry time, right? Mm -hmm. In 1996, Los Angeles County, California, was able to count in 24 hours 2.8 million ballots. In 2022 midterm, it was 1.6 million ballots, not 2.8 million, but 1.6 million, and it took them 11 days. Why? <laughs> the writing's on the wall. You got to rig it. You got to control the paper, and you got to control time. And you need time to do time. You need an excuse. What's the excuse? We can't get them all. Do you think we got better at this shit? in 2022 than we were in 1996 when it was done by hand. Come on, if Paris, France, where they would rather screw you, give you coffee, smoke a cigar, and gamble with you and watch you have sex with their wife, counted 37 million ballots <laughs> as a country in one day. Come on. You ain't lying. You're not lying. Come on. And there we can't, and with the United States of America, we can't do this? Give me a break. Yeah. And, and we can send a rocket to Mars, have it come back and land at the exact same spot and reuse it. But it takes 10 well, days yeah. or a month to count fucking votes, right? You want to know an interesting thing? <laughs> we'll talk about mobile phones. You know, you have, uh, the, ma the movie of the, the ladies that did the math for sending Apollo up and all that stuff, whatever it was, hidden figures, right? Mm -hmm. We sent man to the moon on a computer that figured it all out, a computer that is... 220 times smaller and less efficient than the current cheapest mobile phone you can buy. <laughs> and we got them to the fucking moon and back. <laughs> Something doesn't add up here. Point. Something doesn't add up. Right? We got the technology. We've got the technology to do this. We're just being played like a bunch of idiots. Look, we're the Matrix, brother. We're battery-earning fucking units. They don't want us to know. You want the red pill? You want the blue pill? 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're left, right, upside down, fucking you're a unicorn with eight penises. I don't give a shit what you do with it. But I do care about our vote counting because we're supposed to, they're supposed to work for us. Right? And it's all a charade. It's all a game. We're living in the matrix. Man, we're battery units to them and nothing more. And they're just going to keep on screwing it to us. Tell us what we can eat. Tell us what we can buy. Tell us what we can have and tell us what we can say. And if we're good boys and girls, to let us have groceries and let us continue to live. Yep. That's it. Just like China's doing with that credit score shit. You see what they're doing with that? <clears throat> they're they're calculating and they they implemented it. Social credit card. Yep. Social whatever. The, that's crazy. What you browse affects your credit score. China has an army that is 40 times the size of the U.S. Army. I keep saying 40 that. times the size of the U.S. Army. But they spend more money than their military budget. What's the one thing they spend more money on? Surveilling their own people. Yep. Here's another little kicker, little trivia one. When China went communist, so we have about 330 million Americans in the United States. And this is just to show you how dangerous this is. When China became communist, the Communist Party had 416 members. China as a country had just about a billion people. Now, so you understand scale, 416 is about the number of how many high net worth families, personal chefs there are in the world that have their own personal high-end chef. Mm. There's about 460 of those jobs in the world. Now, that 460 people or 16 people got with one other group, and those were a group of students and intellectuals. And that group was about 42,000 people. And they partnered together to introduce what we know as communism. Now, that 42,000 that's about the size of how many reporters and journalists and newscasters we have in the United States. When they put those two together, that 40, we'll call it 43,000, we'll call it 44,000 just for shits and giggles. Those 44,000 people between protest and controlling the news, the media and academia, which is what they did, made in a country of 1 billion people go communist and give up all their rights that's how dangerous the little small fractions are you got to pay attention to them and if they can get into media and they can control shit they will change the entire destiny and those are the real numbers on communism in china and it's happening before our eyes right now as we speak would you agree i agree i agree we are we're we're in deep doo-doo we've got to like I told you, that's why I did that site, make what go broke dot click. I did that for a reason to give people we gotta take away the money from these woke corporations that are turning us Marxists. We got three hundred and thirty million Americans in the United States. If we can get anywhere from fifteen to twenty million Americans just to realize when you spend money at retail on certain things, you're funding communism. And you're funding market Marxism. And so what we teach people that make what go broke dot click is when you go there, we teach you how to understand the products you have at home and how you can shift that. It's just a simple shift, but you buy exclusively American, American made, American jobs, totally debt free company that owns no owes nobody anything and is not part of that woke mob. And if we can get about 15 million people to do that. In 30 days, the entire system of all of these BlackRock, Venrock, and all this shit that's spending our money to kill us will be over, and we will have re reclaimed our country. Looks like we'll be doing a lot more podcasts, Javon, because we got to get you it should. out. You should. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's the only the, way to get it, it out. We can do this ourselves. It's, yeah. it's just a matter of education. But they pushed everything. The good thing about it, we know it's happened, but these they about 11... Big investment companies now control everything we do, about 11. I'll give you an example. Burt's Bees, you know, lip balm and shit. Yeah. Or Tom's Toothpaste. Everybody loved them because they used homeless people to do it. Or Burt's Bees, all natural. Well, when these guys build those products, which you support, these big conglomerate come in and they'll drop on Burt. Here's $100 million. We want to buy your brand. 
Now, Bert deserves that. He takes us $100 million and leaves. We don't begrudge him that. But you still keep on buying. You just don't realize it's been rolled into this international conglomerate. But now your purchases of those products are supporting critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and the Marxism thing because they're pushing all of this together. They have now pushed 90% of, well, 95% of the con, uh, or your consumables at retail have now all been pushed into these mega Marxist driven corporations that are giving money to Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff. That's how Black Lives Matter got all the billions they did. You mean that's how they got all their, their letters? They've been corralling these products. You mean that's how they got all? You mean that's how they got all the different letters? What? Are we, how many letters are we at now? Remember, it used to be BLM. Now it's like BLM, JCG, AGCCCP. Q squared. Right. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Our own money yeah. is kicking our ass, and it's only because we've been kept in the dark. And so what I decided to do, I, I can teach about elections all day, damn long, talking to politicians, some of the dumbest fucking stumps in the world, ADD to unbelievable, right? Nobody wants to fix it, and they're worried about their image. I can't talk about election stuff. They'll vote me out. No shit. You're going to get voted out anyway. Try doing a podcast. So I decided to move this. Ooh. The mechanism is fight with your own money. They're using your own money to take over your kids, your lives, your churches, and your schools. And so in one simple move, right, because it's these damn woke companies, and we got to make these woke companies go broke. So that's what we did, you know, make woke go broke dot click. We do that, and we'll just show you a very simple thing. If you'll make this switch, we can kick their ass and take their money away because they're doing it with our money. We've made them rich. We got to pull that money back. You don't suffer at all because you still have, you know, American made wonderful products in our economy, but you're taking it away from them. And that's what we have to do. We have to kill. We have to kill these vampires on the vine. And when those and when I try to say, and I'm sure you have too, when you try to explain this and they say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. It doesn't affect me. Yeah, it does. And this is how it affects you, because that's what I keep getting. You better believe it. Ever since I went you down this, this, this wormhole. I'll try to have a, a, a substantial conversation with somebody about all of this that I've learned. And they look at me like mm -hmm. I got 10 eyes. They're not doing anything wrong. And I say, look, it's not about what you're doing wrong. You don't understand the repercussions of what's going on. Uh, you're crazy, right. but the, this podcast has made you crazy. No, you're the one who's crazy. I got five guys, including you now, with 50 years of research way smarter than you, me, and whoever combined. That's 350 years of research, and you're going to tell me that they're wrong? And then you know what they do. This generation, they just go it, back to their it, TikTok. Well, I think, you know, here's what it is. People don't want to admit they're wrong. People don't want to admit that, oh, yeah, I made a bad decision. Or accept. And that's why I decided, tell you what, let me just show you. I'll just show you the things you are buying. Right. That you don't understand the companies behind them. And if you'll just take this and swap it, that's it. Just swap this for this. It's going to be the same stuff, same quality or better. You're at least taking the money you're giving them away from them. It's that simple. Love it. It's Love that it. simple. And I think and the way you're thinking is the that, only way you can get to them. I think the, the way. That's right. That's the only way you can get to them. Is show them that. It's all about money. It's a swap. There's no loss. There's no give or take. It's just a swap. That's right. That's why we did that. And, and, and that's the way we win this war. Not everybody's going to go knock on a door in Canvas. Right. Not everybody can sit down and say, I'm going to take off work for a month to help count fucking ballots in Arizona or whatever, right? But when you understand you have three votes in life, you have three votes, and here's what your three votes are. You have your ballot, which is an incredible peril right now, right? Our country was founded on the Declaration of Independence. It set our country above all countries and set us free that everybody wants to be us. And now we're screwing it up over a simple piece of paper. That's vote number one. Your second vote is what you consume media-wise. You're either looking at poodles and purses, right, or somebody's lunch, or you're looking at mainstream media that is keeping you ignorant so you go along with the plan. That's your vote. So when you're watching somebody like me or you sharing the truth, you are voting, I want the truth. I don't want to be blind anymore. That's your second vote. And your third vote is your money. Because when you buy this stuff, 
and you hand them your money, not only are you buying that bar of soap, hypothetically, you're saying, I agree with your politics. I agree that our boys should be girls, our girls should be boys. We should be lopping their boobies off. We should be doing this. Everybody's racist or whatever. You don't understand what you're buying into. But if you knew behind the scenes where your money goes, you'd cut it off in a heartbeat. You're funding that's them. What we're going to show you. Right. You're funding right. them you're funding. is what you're doing. It's, that's what I say. Forget George Soros. Yeah, he might give somebody a, a, a million bucks for this yeah. or 20 million for this. We're the fucking funders of undoing of our country. All right. Last thing. So I, I can make sure I can get you back in because, uh, you know, I don't want to push too much. What, what do you use there? Sam, a Samsung? What kind of phone do you have? My particular phone? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. No, I when you lifted it up, oh. I, I saw it wasn't an Apple. So I was curious to know what phone you use and why. Are you an Apple user? I am an Apple user, yeah. And which one do you use? I have the 13 Pro. Okay, and what's your password? Well, I'm sure you could brute force into it just like I could do it the same way, too. <laughs> but but uh, I am in the developer program and not the one that everybody gets for free. I'm on, you know how much how many problems are having with uh, Ventura and uh, uh, iOS 16? Because I build the apps. So <laughs> and you, you, usually they do like five betas. We're at like 16. Are you still coding? Yeah. And what are you doing with your your nerdiness? What are you doing with? It? So, well, I didn't, I, I never, I, I would always code uh, web pages. You know, I have year contracts, right. five year contracts, because I do it right. And then I realized. Yeah, I understand your SEO stuff, but yeah. what are you doing with your nerdiness? Well, with my nerdiness, I'm playing with uh, YouTube, Google, seeing what you can override, what you can't override. And then it's always fun to look at the weekly sensors that they put in, usually on Fridays and right. Saturdays that they lock. And just to try to decode what that sensor would be, the last one I saw, I think you'll get a kick out of this. If you were to say on YouTube, uh, peanut gallery, they'll, uh, they'll strike it because the peanut gallery, I guess they're saying is like you're making fun of poor people. And if you say I was blindsided, like in a car crash, that was the last uh, sensor I saw. It's, I guess you're making fun of a blind person. So if you say blindsided and the sensor, when the spider runs and it goes to the voice, you know, recognition, then it goes to the facial right. recognition. If it sees blindsided, you'll see the spider stop. It takes that line, shoots it down to the sensor line. And to make it simple, shoots it back to base. And then base shoots back to the sensor line. Do we knock this down or not? If you go into uh, YouTube code, you'll see it at all. It's like three thousand lines of bullshit. What are you doing? What are you doing with that knowledge base? Well, there's not really because much. I can, I can show you how to monetize that little bit there. <laughs> I didn't even know that shit, buddy. I didn't know either. I, I didn't know either until I didn't think you could do anything like that. I thought it was. I thought it would be a completely different script and everything. Well, but... I know a guy, right? I know a guy. He looks like a fucking biker, but he's really a nerd. He's got a massive forehead, right? It could probably help you with that little idea right there, and we could probably monetize the shit out of it. So we need to talk off. We do need to talk, because I have a really big question for you, and we need to talk. And I and we don't want to die. Just kidding. Just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> the last couple, who the fuck knows? Can I get in on that? <laughs> yeah, why not, Scott? Come I'm, on in with us. <laughs> I'm telling you, here, here's what I usually do with people. Come out with your wackiest shit in your knowledge base, and you may have gems you have no idea you're sitting on. Because, see, that's the difference between how you've been trained and what I've been trained to look for, and my sensors hackled up. And you just hackled up on something that I'm going, hmm, we got to talk. Yeah, we do. We do. And that's the world. That's it. That's it. I'm, yeah. I'm telling you right now, that's it. That's the world. It is. And that's how easy it is to hatch an idea. We could we could do this one and run it all the way through, and you could show somebody how an idea is born. That's it. Thank you so much for your time. Remember, we got to talk after this or tonight or some point. I, I got to run something by you. I want to see what you say. 
We're sure, we're sure. No, no, no problem at all. Thanks, thanks for having me. I'm sorry it was really hell catching up with my schedule. Oh, I understand. But I'm, I'm unfortunately at the drop of the hat available for senators and congressmen and lawyers and stuff. And I never know when it's coming. And my schedule's just been total hell. I wish I could have been there with you. Uh, I wouldn't be hitting your, what'd you call your electronic doobie there? What'd you call it? My what? Oh, my jewel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I used to have, uh, yeah. before I did this, I when uh, vapors first came out and they stopped smoking uh -huh. in Florida. So I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll open up a bar and I'll sell vapor products because now you can, because in Florida you couldn't smoke inside anymore. Uh -huh. So I had a friend who had a wholesale uh, vapor warehouse. He had everything wholesale, you know what I mean? Two dot and all that shit. Uh -huh. So I opened up four bars in Florida. You could drink whatever you want. And then on the other side, while you're drunk, come on over to the uh, vapes. So then I started vaping. Really? Well, then the government, well, Mar not the government, Marlboro, Newport, they realized that the vape industry was taking a punch on their sales. So then we had right. gotten a letter because I had then gotten into the wholesale. So then I was wholesaling myself for more profit. Then I had gotten a letter that in 90 days, all wholesalers would have to, would be taxed 24%. So now, and the uh -oh. yeah, so now the big marketing tactic with that was, well, it's cheaper to get a vape for 20 bucks and 30 ounces of juice for 20 bucks than a carton of cigarettes. Well, when they come down right. with a 24% wholesale tax, that means now I have to sell to the store at a 25% increase. And now that store has to increase at, minimum. at a minimum. Right. And now it's no longer cheaper to vape than smoke. So before that got out, I sold all of them. However, I picked up the friendly addiction of vaping nicotine and I never even smoked cigarettes. I was never a cigarette smoker or anything. Wow. But I, you but I like my, it and I, I don't want to quit. What's that? There you go. That's cool. You want to hear a great Florida bar story? Yeah. True story. I had a buddy who had a friend that he went to high school with. And in Naples, Florida, he was opening a bar. Couldn't tell you the name or anything. It's irrelevant to the story. And so here's how he promoted his bar. He opened his bar. And he hired 20 call girls. And all he did was sent them in every night and says, you're picking out the ugliest motherfucker. You're sucking the chrome off the trailer hitch. You're going to do anything he wants, everything he wants right there. And you're going to do it half a dozen times a night. And I'm going to pay you for your time. And that was the first month of his bar. And the word of mouth got out that even the ugliest motherfucker on the planet could get laid if he went to that bar. <laughs> and it was packed asshole to elbows forever after that. <laughs> that was a marketing strategy. <laughs> that was a marketing strategy. If you were ever looking for a job, sir, please contact one of us <laughs> sitting here <laughs> or on screen. <laughs> that was, I'm telling you, that that is the most brilliant marketing strategy I ever heard. And, and because once it has that reputation... It's always it. And it works, you know, men and women, women are going to go to Queen. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go there because that's where all the guys go, right? It became a self-fulfilling prophecy and he did it with call girls. And I thought that was, that's a brilliant stroke of genius. I got to tell you one funny one real quick. It's only two minutes. Sure. S Scott's heard it before. Sure. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm dating this girl from Ecuador, right? And for whatever reason, I just. Did you say dating or dating? Dating, dating, dating. Like, dating. Okay. Yeah, yeah, dating. I'm okay. sorry. So I'm I'm dating this girl. She's from Ecuador. For whatever reason, right? I could take her to dinner, purses, you name it. It's just not working. So I say, were you ever married? She says, yeah, I was married. Oh, okay. And what did your husband do? He was an engineer. Okay. I keep trying. No, no luck. So I go and I say, okay, I'm going to be a fucking engineer. Because I get extreme, whether it's coding, podcasting. If I decide I'm going to do something, I'm I'm just like this. So right. I open up an engineering firm. I go to Craigslist, and I think to myself, all these top engineers around here that built all these things, they must have worked 10, 12 hours a day. Now they're retired at home with their wife. They can't possibly uh -huh. want to be home. And their wife has to be like, please just go get a job part-time somewhere because for 50 years they weren't right. home. So I go right. on Craigslist and I hire five engineers. One built Miami University, whatever. All major guys, old as hell, 
would not use AutoCAD. They used the Octagon and everything. So then when I went to pick a name, this is where the MSCS comes from. The breakers down here is the big prestigious hotel. You know, you can't get a room there from for less than 1800 a night. Every celebrity, Pacino, everybody goes there. So the company that had did all their building was ACS. So I get uh-huh. the guy who built Miami University to sign on my company as a structural engineer. Now I have the building plans. Right. So now right. ACS worked on the breakers. I named mine MSCS. I called the breakers. I know nothing about engineering. Nothing. It interests me. No interest at all. And I say, hey, mm-hmm. this is MSCS uh, Engineering. We worked on your building uh, in 2008. I told him this later after I did it. You know, we just wanted to know if you needed any work done. You know what? We've been looking for you guys. We lost our, our computer crashed. We need some work on the Italian restaurant, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, end up building, uh, fixing the column at the <laughs> Italian restaurant. I got an award for engineering company of 2019. <laughs> I was in the papers and everything. And I finally did. That's leveraging talent. And I, and I finally did a uh, score. <laughs> there you go. And made you zero money. Brainiacs. And I made zero <laughs> money because when, when, uh, you know, they had said, okay, we'll give you this much to do it. I didn't realize that it cost that much to do it, <laughs> but I won. The, but you know what? You learned and yeah. you'll never make that mistake again. I will not. Pretty funny, that's right? It works. Look, look, I think that's, that's, that's a great story. I always tell people, look, if you don't try, what is your chance of failure? A hundred percent. Yeah. If you do try, what are your chances of failure? It's now 50, 50. It either will or it won't. You, you, you have a, you instantly change your odds by just, I'll try it. Otherwise yeah. you're a hundred percent guaranteed. It ain't going to work because you, you just don't do it. And that's that's the as simple as the secret is. You're you're so awesome, man. I, I never would have thought you had the the humor that you have. You are you are a blast. You're a blast. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Great guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Take uh, care. Sure. Thank you. Whenever you have time, let me know because I have a lot more to ask you. Thank you, Absolutely. sir. I appreciate we'll it. it.